You ain't you know, it's a part of China. Adam Curry, John C. Dvorak. It's Thursday, October 11th, 2018. This is your award-winning Gitmo Nation Media Assassination, episode 1076. This is No Agenda. Reading the IPCC special report so you don't have to. And broadcasting live from the capital of the drone star state here in downtown Austin, Tejas, in the Cluedo. In the morning, everybody. I'm Adam Curry. And from Northern California, which we consider the zone star state, I'm John C. Dvorak. Crackpot and Buzzkill in the morning. Wow, first time in uh, almost 11 years you said, uh, you didn't say Silicon Valley. You said from Northern California. I did? Yeah. I've lost it. (laughs) 11 years was a good time. Good run, John, good run. It's over now, I guess. Oh, well. Hey, there was finally some news to look at. Uh, well, I thought I got a lot of news to look at. I think we're overclipped, actually, for today. Oh, just yeah, just evaluating. Yeah. yeah. Well, we don't have to no do... no dupes from the last show. <laughs> no dupes. It's no, no dupes allowed. Yeah, there was just know, there was lots of stuff. Um, we, not for now, but I did go through the, you know, the IPCC special report. I am glad. Yes. Because I didn't. I knew, you. yes, of course you would. Now, what I do expect you did is you went through the Google, the good sensor um, leaked document and have an analysis of that for us. I did go through it, but I don't have an analysis. Hmm. Oh, that's uh, too bad. <laughs> Here I was expect- <laughs> like, Dad, John's guy, he was tweeting. By the way, ever I was si- tweeting. I tweeted ever myself. Si- out. John, ever since you got fired for not having the right attitude about 5G, you've been insane on Twitter. I mean, I you're on off. day or night. You're on. You're tweeting this. You're tweeting that. Hey, you should write a book about crazy California. You're, yeah. so, you're, all, you're all over the... You even agreed to an interview with Gray America. I mean, your life is changing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you keep the guy keeps saying I blocked him. I don't know where he gets this. No, it's just because we never we, we never respond. Like, hey, come on the show. We're like, uh-huh. well, the <laughs> the fact that we have it on the stream, I figured. Oh, I guess I can do this show. <laughs> Even though I, you're the one that told me not to. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you are <laughs> uh, a two Brutus. Nice, <laughs> very very nice. <laughs> All right, so we had a lot of pretty fun moments to look at. Uh, although I'm, I'm, I'm really growing a little bit concerned about what's happening to people. You know, it's just, it's, they seem somewhat out of control. <laughs> you know, there's, there's banging on the Supreme Court doors, there's crying. It's kind of this Kavanaugh vote uh, to me felt a little bit like you know, almost like the election again. Yeah, you know, a little pe- bit. People getting you know, just. Crazy, crazy, and a, and a lot of inaccuracies. Here's a quickie. Uh, this is Caitlin Thomas from CNN, uh, who just, uh, in passing, just said something which I found interesting. No one corrected her on. Clarence Thomas was seen clapping in the room. Now, this was at the uh, the ceremony for uh, uh, Kavanaugh that uh, you know the the, uh, the ceremony is swearing in. Clarence Thomas was seen clapping in the room. I don't know if any of the other justices were, but Clarence Thomas, who, of course, during his confirmation hearings was also accused of sexual assault, was there clapping as well. Uh, I know he wasn't. He wasn't accused of sexual assault. I've noticed this, and I think I tweeted about it in my frenzy, uh, (laughs) which is that Clarence Thomas, as they brought him in, they tried to make it sound as though the whole thing about him was the same as Kavanaugh, which was sexual assault. No, not and at he all. Never w- once was if, it under was about, any circumstances. It was about was inappro- of no. That. It was about inappropriate comments in the workplace. Yeah, inappropriate comments. Yeah, yeah. What pubic was it? Pubic hair, long pubic dong, hair, silver. long dong, silver, pubic hair, and a coke can. Which, by the way, I totally believe. I do too. I think that, that he looks like the kind of goofball. Yeah, but he, Anita Hill was, yeah, you know, she worked everywhere he worked. I think she was a fangirl, and then something happened between him, and then she said, "Oh, be. screw this stuff." I think that's what happened. Just recollecting well, from back cares? in the day. No, oh, nobody wasn't it sexual assault, and I and the fact that CNN, yeah, that does none of this surprises me. They're terrible news people. <laughs> yeah, but that, that makes it so much fun for us. Uh, yeah, well, this week it's, it's, in. This no ABC this week, which I caught a little bit of. 
they did a lot of clipping, actually. Uh, they had on um, a quote-unquote reporter from Vice. And I say quote-unquote reporter because it's an ad agency, so she's probably in sales. There uh, goes the Zephyr. Oh, perfect timing. Um, and the question of these pro- of the protesters in the halls of the Senate and outside the Supreme Court and... You know, were any of them paid? Well, yeah. Vice News actually spent a lot of time with the protesters over yes. this past week. We saw the president say these are professional protesters paid by George Soros, et cetera, et cetera. What, 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 who? Hey, by the way, we need a Soros thing from uh, Fletcher. We don't you know, have, the funny thing, do yes, we, we have do. That? Fletcher, we need a Soros thing. By the way, this is the only duplicate clip we have. I have this exact same clip. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I'll because it's that. such a good clip. Because yeah. this guy, the 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 host, yeah, I, I, I think it's the same clip. It sounds like it. The host is like adamant about, yeah, the, the, the president's a jerk. He says everyone was paid, <laughs> and she confirms that they were, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. What, what, what? Who were these people? What was so going on? A lot of them were were normal people who are mad. We, Normies. We hung out with a group from Alaska who was very specifically talking to Lisa Murkowski. Um, a lot of them were Native Americans, which also played into Lisa Murkowski's decision. They actually felt a lot of respect for her because she brought them into their office. Um, she had a real conversation with them. And we also saw people who were organized. And that moment with Jeff Flake on the Hill, we talked to one woman who works for Ultraviolet who was paid. She helped steer people in the right ways to be able to to confront. So there were paid. There were people who were paid by organizations like Ultraviolet to to try to harness that energy in a way that would make the viral moments that we ended up seeing. Well, there you go. She admits not just were they paid, but they were paid to harness the energy to create the viral moments that we were witness to. It, PR. It's, thank you very much, Vice Girl. Yep. She said it right that there. That was very revealing. Uh, the First Lady uh, was asked on ABC uh, about her thoughts and... And of course, this is how it is portrayed, just a little snippet. I support the women, and they need to be heard. We need to support them. And, you know, also men, not just women. Do you think men in the, in the news that have been accused of, of sexual assault, sexual harassment, have been treated unfairly? We need to have a really hard evidence that, you know, that if you're accused of something, show the evidence. All right. Go yeah, Melania. it makes nothing but sense, so the evidence. Yeah, hard evidence. So the evidence. Oh. Well, while you're on that kind of thing, we also had uh, on uh, Tom Perez on the Chris Hayes show. Tom Perez, head of the Democratic right. uh, oh, yeah. uh, National he's, Committee. Yeah, he's the he's the he's the head of the whole uh, party. Yeah, he makes the, he kind of makes a little uh, flub. Oh. Day in and day out. When we see that there are no guardrails in Washington, I mean, we, we, we know that for sure. There, there are no moderate Democrats, basically, left, moderate Republicans left in the United <laughs> <Careful>. States. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I, I need to say, Tucker Carlson has been doing something very douchey for the past two nights. And uh, actually, I should probably move back a little bit. So for some reason, the word mob has now become a problem. Mob. Uh, Mob. Yeah. If you say, if you use the the mob about. It's like thug. Yeah. Well, exactly. Exactly. They haven't quite made it racist yet, but they're saying. They will. People who are, you know, stopping cars in Seattle, that's not a mob. People who are. Portland. uh, Portland. I'm sorry. People who are banging on the doors of the Supreme Court and breaking down and trying to rip it open. uh, That's not a mob. That's just a. you know, people who were angry. Peaceful protesters. And I think this is the clip that kind of started off with uh, Matt Lewis of the Daily Beast, who made the faux pas of using the word mob uh, on uh, Brooke Baldwin's show on CNN. I believe it's the overreaction of the left. When you see people like Ted Cruz getting chased out of restaurants by a mob. Oh, when you see, you're when not you, going to use the mob I will, word Oh, it's, it's totally a mob. It is without a there's doubt. A mass, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there's no other word mass. for it. It's a look, go mass. watch. Put up a the mob. Video, stop. Stop. A Put mob. Up the video. A mob is what we saw in Charlottesville, Virginia, two oh, August no, ago. No, a mob is both. not what we saw chasing. I'm what not about, saying what, what they the did people, was right. What about the people who were at the Supreme Court banging on the walls? What do you call that? Civil protest, or is that a mob? I think it's easily a mob. Yeah, and if it were Tea Partiers, we'd call it a mob for sure. Come on, let's be serious. 
Let me, let me let me let me move past the M word because I do feel like that is part of <laughs> the, the, the weaponization <laughs> of, yes. of what's happening now on the right. It's the M word. <laughs> All right, let's look at mob. Oh, this is a very good idea. Of course, we should be doing that. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. on, on. Yeah. Large crowd of people, especially one that is disorderly and intent on causing trouble or violence, or uh, crowd around someone in an unruly and excitable way uh, in order to admire or attack them. Uh Uh-huh. Wrong. It's the M word. This is another verboten word. Write it down. The M word. So Tucker Carlson on Fox News took this and mm, Hillary Clinton had done an interview while she was right before after she spoke at Oxford. And the interview was on CNN by globalist extraordinaire CFR member Christiana Amanampur. I I realize I've always been saying I've realized I always said Anampur, but it's Amanpur. The M comes first. Yeah. And so this is what he did with it. Hillary Clinton is so worried, though, about how dangerous the Republican Party has become. Those angry Mormon grandmothers in black bandanas you're seeing in downtown Portland smashing windows that she no longer considers Republicans Americans or even fully human. According to Hillary Clinton, you no longer have to be civil to Republicans. You can do whatever you want to them because they deserve it. You cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for, what you care about. That's why I believe if we are fortunate enough to win back the House and or the Senate, that's when civility can start again. Yeah, when we win, civility can return. So there you have it, the perfect distillation. There's the most recent Democratic presidential candidate, the leader of her party by default, endorsing viciousness openly against her political opponents. See, but this is out of context. And as I've said many times, whenever something is viral, because this clip of her saying that, not with the Tucker Carlson bit, but this clip of, because that's where he gets his, his material from, or his producers. Is from online. It was completely viral. Everyone's playing this. Oh, she go. Do want? She's approving. Go uh, mess up uh, some Republicans. But really, in context of what came next, or the entire interview, which actually I pulled a couple other clips from because I thought she said some really egregious stuff in the interview. This was not it. This is just her way of saying you've got to vote. And here's how how she kind of wrapped it around. Uh, here we go. When the Republican Senate denied the right of President Obama to have his nominee for the Supreme Court, Merrick Garland, uh, heard. I think you even wrote that they stole a justice from the Democratic well, I think, Party. I, I think they did. I, I mean, to keep a Supreme Court seat open for a year, uh, to deny a distinguished jurist, they could have voted him down. They could have said, well, for ideological reasons, philosophical reasons, uh, we're not going to vote for him. But no, they stonewalled. And that was such a breach of Senate ethics and the constitutional responsibility of uh, the Senate to advise and consent on nominations that you cannot be civil with a political party that wants to destroy what you stand for, what you care about. That's why I believe if we are fortunate enough to win back the House and or the Senate, that's when civility can start again. So when you're dealing with an ideological party that is driven by the lust for power, that is funded by corporate interests who want a government that does its bidding, it's hard. you can be civil, but you can't overcome what they intend to do unless you win elections. So, you know, if you take the whole thing in context, he's really riling people up. Yes, yeah, she says you got you got to win elections. And this yeah. has nothing to do with being a I'm mob. I'm not gonna argue. I I, I could have had that clip. I listened to it and I decided that it was just like just tuckered. I, yeah, I but, figured that. But, t- he, he, but he's doing it for two days in a row, and I'm tired of it. I'm it's riling thinking, people up. Well, he's here's what I'm thinking. It's going mm. on there. Mm. We've watched this show since its inception. We watched him, you know, get to certain modes and yeah, you know, get yeah. people on and then attack him. And then everyone got a clue and nobody comes on. And he's had to readjust uh, his model. The, the formula for the show has changed 
at least twice, maybe three times. And this is another attempt at changing it again to get something that works that doesn't end up making him be by himself or people not come on the show. Right. And I don't know, you know, I think this is a, I think this particular model where he goes off on something a little minor in this case, um, or exaggerated, which is the way you would have it. Yeah. I think this is just another attempt at, at getting a better formula. I, I could see, I'd rather see where it goes. It yeah. might work out. He's using, it's like he's using O'Reilly's old fire. Yeah, hose. yeah. And it's, to me, it's off-putting. It's like, this is one of the few cable news shows I'll watch. Because he he does have interesting people from the left come on, and although he always is asking the same stupid question, but this just went too far. Uh, There was some other stuff in this Hillary interview I'd like to share, though. So she had a number of, I found, rather remarkable little bits to say, of course, with this tour that's coming up, this speaking tour, which she also addresses. uh, Yeah, the uh, the pre-20. Yeah, she's running. She is running. She's running. Duh. She's just sitting there just waiting for for the opportunity to say, well, seeing as you guys have nothing, I guess I'm your only hope. But, yep. but, she's, a, but she's the new Adlai Stevenson. But she's got problems with the white women. White women. White people. White women. Last night, President Trump had a sort of ceremony for now Justice Kavanaugh at the White House. And he apologized on behalf of the American people the for the immense amount of pain and harm uh, that, that he said that the judge had been put through by this system. What do you make of that? And what message, including the president's mocking of Christine Blasey Ford for her allegations, what message does that send to women? And remember, women went for President Trump white in women. 2016. White women. White women. All women went for me. And All women. Look, white women have been uh, voting against Democratic presidential candidates for uh, decades now. Really? Yeah, because you're, you're douches. <laughs> Wait, didn't white women all come out for Obama? Am I missing something? Ah, uh, good point. Please. The, the, uh, white women were in love with the guy. White women. Why is it? <laughs> uh, the white vote has only been won twice in the last um, 60 years. Uh, my husband being one of the two. Uh, Lyndon Johnson being the other. Huh. So it's not a surprise. It's huh. a disappointment. But it's not a surprise. Well, those guys must be racist then. So what, why is it disappointing that whites don't vote for your white husband? I mean, wh- I don't, whatever she's saying, she sounds racist. And it's, I don't know. You know, it's part of a grand scheme identity politics thing. And that, yeah. Oh, and yeah. It, it dissuade the whites from doing anything as if the there's no what the whole thing is. <laughs> I don't get it because I think it's a counterproductive. Uh, I don't think it's working. It hasn't shown any signs of working. Uh, I don't know what she's thinking. She's just shooting herself in the foot yet again. Well, but already she's alienated white men. White men are just the patriarchy. We're the problem. Now white women are no good. Yeah. I, this makes little sense to me, but let's talk about the Russians. If we don't get smarter, uh, and I include myself in this, you know, and I did not know the extent to which there was uh, Russian interference. I knew there had been some in my election. I didn't understand the pressures from the right wing, frankly, on Jim Comey that would cause him to interfere in the election to my detriment. Ooh, ooh, you hear that little interfere in the the election to my detriment? Mm -hmm. Hello, Jim Comey. Those were things that were almost unimaginable. Who, 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 when setting up a presidential campaign, was said, "Oh, and don't forget, we have to worry about the Russians manipulating the outcome." We have. To- oh, I, I like this. This is more apology. Like if I was setting up a presidential, I'd have to think about the Russians. What the fuck? If I had known this, I would have won. Yeah, if I'd only known about the Russians, and I would, I would have won. I'm gonna stop the Russians. There's the Russians. Worry about the Russians manipulating the outcome. We have to worry about the FBI director intervening into it we have to worry about wikileaks which is a wholly owned subsidiary of russian intelligence <laughs> what? Who would- <laughs> what yeah wholly, wholly owned, owned wholly subsidiary, owned subsidiary. Russian, what since when oh, since they paid off julian assange didn't you hear about this the share transaction was a reverse merger they backed God. into a shell. To worry There's about WikiLeaks. No which is, evidence that indicates that. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of Russian intelligence. I mean, who would have thought that those were the challenges we face? So we do have to get tougher and smarter 
and stronger. Not cross the line into lying, but there's enough truth and facts that should be more widely known. It's very, about very, that. very interesting what she says there. Like no. the lie she just told about <laughs> Julian Assange. <laughs> that was. <laughs> It, maybe that's why she said that. Because <clears throat> I was trying to figure out, you know, why why are you saying, oh, don't cross the line, don't lie about stuff, but there's enough. And you're right. Maybe it was about Assange and WikiLeaks that she that she felt the need to say that. Well, I'm not really lying. It's just enough facts and proof to show that it's a wholly owned subsidiary of of, of the, the Russian, Russian government. It's not what these Republicans stand for, who's bidding they are doing, oh. and where Trump really comes from. And at some point... <laughs> Queens? The accumulation of evidence about how Trump uh, uh, and his father manipulated their business, how they, oh, in, in so many the billionaire ways. billionaire Fred? <laughs> oh, wait. This is really rich to coin a phrase coming from her, from her Miss Clinton Foundation, tax dodgers of the, of the, of the century. But listen to this. Business, how they, in, in so many ways, broke you know, at least the spirit, if not the letter of tax laws. Whoa. <laughs> John, whenever I do my taxes, I always think in the spirit. I Like, the spirit is to give more money to the government. Isn't that the spirit? What is the spirit of the tax law? Yeah. The tax law is no spirit. It's, com- it's complete slave control. It's not spirit. How he did business with the mafia, how oh, he's indebted oh. to the Russians at some point. Oh, he did business with the mafia, indebted to the Russians. Point. That has to matter, but it won't matter unless Democrats keep driving this message about what's really at stake with the presidency of someone who admires dictators, who clearly has authoritarian tendencies. Now, she, she went on in quite a tangent and I clipped down a lot of stuff here, but now she's asking a very important question about this dictatorship around the world and and the nationalists and the far right and she has, she has some questions about this why is it when the world and particularly the west is by any measure richer safer healthier stronger what is giving rise to these yearnings not for greater freedom and for a democracy that really lives up to its name where you don't try to uh-huh. throw voters off the rolls but you want everyone to vote what is it that is motivating large numbers of people to seek the kind of leadership that will limit freedom <laughs> starting with the press academia <laughs> political parties and why is it that so many on the right in the United States and in Europe look to Putin, a, a known Putin. authoritarian? They're all looking to Putin, John. Nobody's the, looking to Putin. Hey, Putin, what are you doing? Let me look at you. <laughs> Vladimir, what are you doing today? I have to emulate it. So many on the right in the United States and in Europe look to Putin, a, a known Who looks authoritarian. To Putin? Everybody on the right, including the Europeans. So many on the right in the United States and in Europe look to Putin, a a known authoritarian, someone who has journalists and political opponents uh, murdered with impunity. (laughs) With impunity. (laughs) What what does that mean in that context, with impunity? What does that mean? Well, you know what? I think just because we want to first this (laughs) mellow. There we go. Impunity. Define impunity. Because he kills journalists with impunity. In, does that mean like on Monday well, it morning? Means the exemption from punishment or freedom from the injurious consequences of an action. Oh, okay. So he kills journalists without getting punished for it. Yeah, he doesn't get punished. Although she has to take a lot of grief from her, or that's kind of punishment. <laughs> What is going on in the minds of 21st century Americans and Europeans that would lead them to say, you know, I I just want to have security, stability, and I think we need a strong leader. Well, hold on a second. Is that a bad thing? I'm asking you a question. Well, the way she puts it, it's not because 
But you that, do want a strong isn't that leader. exactly what everyone wants? Security. Everybody says they want a strong leader. They bitch about Trump being insane and unhinged. He's not a strong <laughs> Let leader. Let me hear it again. That would lead them to say, you know, I, I just want to have okay. security, stability, and I think we need a strong leader. Security, stability, and a strong leader. That seems kind of like what everybody kind wants. She ran on that platform. Now, some of it is traced to discriminatory feelings, prejudice, bias, that other people are getting ahead at a greater rate or somehow to their disadvantage of me. And so people look and say, well, these cultural changes, whether it's you know, a woman's right to choose or gay marriage or whatever it might be, that somehow they find threatening. And so there are cultural forces at work that are now spilling over into political allegiance that is often described as tribalism. So, yeah, I want my freedom, but limit hers. Take, take away her right to choose. Oh, just and, rambling. And you know what? Yeah. I, I shouldn't have to sell a cake or provide a service to a gay person because that impinges on my freedom. And all of a sudden, rambling. you start to see the atomization <laughs> and the fragmentation. All right. Uh see what do i have left here oh yeah this was oh Animization, fragmentation there's no what she's talking about she's completely oh, off she's the just, rails yeah she's just using alliteration everywhere uh here she now she's very aware of what's going on with the the china social credit score system which is not something everybody's aware of i don't think it, you know it hasn't really been subject to any well, they're real aware deep of it. analysis they think it's a good idea oh the chinese are engaged in constructing a surveillance state that will surveil everyone. You don't have to live in Western We're China. Uh, you can be in Beijing or Shanghai or any other part of China where the Han Chinese uh, live. And you're now going to be subjected to facial recognition, to something they call a social credit score, where you get points from your government for doing things your government approves of. And you get, apparently, demerits and maybe even punished for doing things your government doesn't approve of. Now, you can tell oh, she's liking the idea. She's like, this is interesting. Well, she's digging it. Yeah. Who is making those decisions? Uh, there is a uh, very concerted effort by this current Chinese government to um, prevent the Internet from influencing opinion inside China. That's exactly what you want, too. Now, as they develop these tools, and they're very tools. sophisticated. Mm, they're, they're all very sophisticated. But they're going to sell them. Oh. And it won't necessarily just be the Russians who are uh. competing to apply such tools. Uh. The Iranians, uh. the North Koreans, who uh. already have a police state, but uh. can actually impose even greater uh, uh. control through uh. this. Other countries that uh, are electing populist or nationalist uh, <laughs> uh, leaders who are creating authoritarian regimes, even if they were first elected. So it's not going to only affect the Chinese people. She's, she's got her checkbook ready, from what I can tell. It's like, this is great. I can buy that from the Chinese. What does she bring up the Han Chinese for? Uh, well, because the question was a little more involved and about Muslims in, in China and how the Chinese are putting them in, deter in uh, internment camps and it's stuff. You, yeah. yeah. But I think the only thing we all really want to know, final clip, is well, how about the speaking tour? What is she going to do on the speaking tour? We know the short answer, which is prepare for and deploy her presidential campaign part trois. But let's hear it from the horse's mouth. Okay, before you wait, before you play, I uh, should mention uh, she's looking for playbooks, and I think she she thinks the speaking tour will will give her the kind of uh, who had a, who had that as a playbook previously, Reagan. Mm. Okay, Reagan gave a speaking tour on behalf of General Electric, which was a very conservative speaking tour. It was called the speech. Uh huh. And the speech was used as a model for his later speeches. Then he developed the, the speech over a number. Of, he, but, I, but I think he did hundreds of lectures, hundreds of tours. He was floating all over the place. And the idea was to test the waters for uh, his kind of conservative thinking. Huh. Interesting. And I think that's the playbook. Okay. To that end, it appears that you and your husband, President Clinton, are going to go on a big city, 13 citywide mm -hmm. speaking engagement mm -hmm. around the United States, just being announced. What is it that you plan to say? What are you going to talk about? 
Well, we were asked to do this. Um, sure. Apparently, there's sure. some appetite for it. Appetite. Uh, but it's going to be both personal, um, which is something people um, are very interested in. Do you think that people will heckle her when she does this? No, they won't allow it. Yeah, but you can buy a ticket. You can just buy a ticket like everybody else if you have the money. I think the lowest think ticket on the be, tour is be paid for. They're just going to do it to make money. Oh yeah, the lowest ticket is seventy five bucks, and the highest I think is seven hundred. Well, I would like to see him heckled, although that the it's less likely because it's not the heckling type of people that are against her. No, you get kicked out, but it'll make for some great viral video viral moments it probably wouldn't make for any videos it probably you know <laughs> who knows whatever the case i think there's another problem with this speaking tour that's going to do you want to do you want to hear the rest of the tour what it's about yeah, i do but i want to okay. mention this too mm -hmm. which is that how does she speak with bill bill is the great speaker he'll just hog the mic ah well she does this she brings this up in well listen to it uh, obviously i'll talk about my grandchildren <laughs> but i think from my uh, perspective it will be also answering questions about what's happening in our country and the world uh both bill and i are deeply concerned uh <laughs> earlier in the interview you quoted what rama Emanuel said about bill and you know bill had to be incredibly strong first to get elected then to get reelected, and to survive mm -hmm. and it was not uh, easy by any means, obviously, uh, but he really believes that Democrats have to be tougher and have to stand up to the bullying and the intimidation. What? Uh, <laughs> by the way, I think if and when she runs, I'm pretty sure she will, they do this oh, yeah. speaking tour, and I, I presume they'll time it pretty close towards an announcement. She can still pull off the old Kill Bill trick just before the election. Well, it'll be his swan you know, song, it, uh, you she, know, she, the problem with the last time around, we have this theory on the show and people, you know, we haven't been called out on it for being gruesome or, or, or ghoulish, but we could have been. Uh, we had predicted that Bill would have been uh, somehow uh, something would have happened to him before the election. No, remember, the full the full theory is he would die of a heart attack, but it would be in the saddle with a couple of hookers. Well, that's not that's not the full theory. That's a funny version of what you'd think is funny. Uh, it was your but, it was your funny. It probably was, <laughs> but I wasn't serious. But get, getting him killed so he could have a big you know, draw a lot of attention to how his you know his balance the budget and all this stuff yeah. and get him yeah. elected. Yeah. That was going to be done if the, she was losing the election, but. There was never any indication that she was going to lose. She was right. going to win right, right until the last day. Yeah. So she never got to pull this stunt. Well, it could be used as a precursor now. I'm, I'm just thinking it's, it's, it just it just struck me. So I think he'll have things wait, to wait, say about stop. You can't do it. Too, I, I, we, this, we, I don't want to say this. We're, this is the same debate we had before. The timing is everything. Yes. You can't do it too soon. No. But that, that all depends on the tour. I don't have the dates of the tour. And by the way, this tour, it maybe could happen during the tour because it's going to be apparent that you can't tour around with Bill. You just look like his sidekick. <laughs> Bill, But also, Bill is speaking pretty slow these days. Yeah, but he gets all jacked up in front of an audience. He can move. I've seen these guys. I I went to, not to go too far off base, but I got to watch Arnold Toynbee give a speech once. Who's that? And I later tracked him down so I could get him to autograph a book. Who is Arnold Toynbee? Arnold Toynbee is one of the greatest historians ever. Oh. And he was in his 80s or something when he gave this speech. He gives this rousing speech about, you know, world change and everything else. And then when you go to meet him, the guy's walking dead. <laughs> so some guys are pretty good at jacking right. themselves up in front of an audience. Yeah, some guys are like Weinstein. Oh, no, I'm sorry, jacking up. Up to the bullying and <laughs> the intimidation. <laughs> So I think he'll have things to say about his own experience and how it applies here. He was hot. I will certainly have a lot to say about what's going on in the world today based on mm -hmm. not only my Secretary of State years, but my travel. And my book, What Happened, which came out in paperback, which oh, uh, has an afterward where plug. I talk about these threats to democracy. Threats. I don't want it to be too serious because I think a lot of people will be coming just to see us, to show their support. To no, support for what? Support. Support for... Get on the mailing list. <laughs> to show their support. The support for what? To support her income? No. 
They're showing yeah, support for what? That's a good catch. The support, support is Support for what? Because she's running. Came out in paperback, which uh, has an afterword where I talk about these threats to democracy. I don't want it to be too serious because I think a lot of people will be coming just to see us, to show their support, to be part of uh, a, a gathering of uh, like-minded folks. folks. But I do want to uh, leave some thoughts, as I tried to do in the speech today, about what each of us can do. Oh. You say that you're going to talk about the difficulties that your husband went through, that you went mm -hmm. through. Obviously, you're going to be prepared to have questions about that moment in 1998, the impeachment, um, the oh. allegations of oh. sexual harassment <laughs> against your own husband. Are you prepared? Oh, I, yeah. yeah, well, go ahead. I thought... I thought that we're going to talk about how the troubles you went through when he threw out his back stealing furniture from the White House after they left. <laughs> I told Tina that story last night. She says, "What?" I said, "Yeah, well, when they take, didn't they take China and stuff? Took all kinds Find of stuff, China. Did whatever they could get. Charity. But did they did they give it back? Whatever happened to yeah, that? Yeah, they got busted for it. They're told to return it." <laughs> prepared to answer those questions, is he prepared to answer them? And how do you see that? Mm -hmm similar or different from what president trump is being accused of and kavanaugh and others today okay so now this is interesting let's just review how is what bill clinton was accused of namely rape 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 <laughs> he was accused of rape <laughs> uh and uh, inappropriate behavior in the oval office to me not impeachable you know dog no but it was the lie that got him impeached yes it was Don't the lie that. that got him impeached Depends Perjury. on what the, morning, what the meaning of the word is, is. Uh, but how does it differ what he was accused of, namely rape, from uh, Trump and Kavanaugh? Question. That, has Trump been accused of rape? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you Kav remember that bullcrap 13-year-old thing because he went with Jeffrey Epstein, yep. Clinton's buddy, yeah. <laughs> to, uh, on to, the island, to the island. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this yeah. is a lot of nonsense. No, well, but they were women who actually said he raped me. Uh, Kavanaugh? That's Clinton. Also Trump. Who? Yep. Exactly. The woman who was on the island. She... She, she that 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 was never documented. It was just a she phony did, story that they, uh, they printed. I'm okay. Thanks. Just go with the flow. Okay. Kavanaugh. Yeah. Now, was any rape accusation there? Was that? Um, let's just no. He let's was never, he just rolled over on somebody. Let's discredit the uh, Avenatti accusations since oh, yeah, everyone just, else did, except for the media. <laughs> All right. But how is is it different? Allegations of sexual harassment mm -hmm. against your own husband. Are you prepared to answer those questions? Is he prepared to answer them? And how do you see that mm -hmm. similar or different from what President Trump is being accused of and Kavanaugh and others today? Well, uh, there's a very significant difference. Oh. Uh, and that is the intense, long-lasting, partisan investigation <laughs> that was conducted <laughs> in the 90s. Great answer. <laughs> what the hell did she say? What does that mean? The difference between what Bill was accused of and uh, Trump and Kavanaugh and men like that is that Bill went through a very rough investigation. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost too delicious to believe, my friends. So, I mean, that is the land of unconfirmed. Yes, yes, we came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So she's running. Yeah. She's Let already that. circumventing uh, questions like that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we knew she was going to run, and the yeah. Democrats have got to be completely freaked out about this because they know that she's not going to win. You can't keep running the same per candidate. They didn't vote her in the first time for a lot of good reasons. Yes, but John— She's going to the... get less votes this time. No, but they're going to change the Electoral College. At, at, at best, no, discredit it. No, of course they can't. But this talk, with the, what the former New York banker was bitching about, this is really ratcheted up. What is he? What did he bitch about? The, the electoral, the elec college? electoral so he college. Wants to run the country? He, yes. Or isn't thinking straight. And now Edison Research for the upcoming uh, midterm, Edison Research will provide. Uh, by the way, they they give this news. Uh, they give this to a lot of people. Will provide exit polls and will tabulate the national vote across every county in the United States. And they'll be doing that for ABC, CBS. CNN and NBC news departments. You see, they're going okay, to be so reporting on the happen. popular vote again. Here's what's going to happen. And I would include California in this. 
she's going to lose the popular vote. She's going to lose both the popular vote and the electoral vote, and it's going to be moot. And because no one's going to vote for her. I mean, you can't – she's just be a third time she runs, and she's not effective. She's an ineffective candidate. She has the wrong people around her. She makes the wrong decisions. She, they're all just a bunch of l- lunatics working for her. They're no good. And there's no way she can win. It's going to get worse and worse. The thing they've got to do is they've got to run somebody who can beat Trump, and they can't find anyone. And she's a lizard. Well, she probably is a yeah, lizard. That's just, true. She doesn't sweat. Just to add that. Hey, I got a lot of feedback from um, our Instagram Adderall convo. Yeah. Uh, and very little people, well, a couple agreed and just went, oh, my gosh, you're so right about Instagram and Adderall being a perfect pairing. But what I got the most response for, and I'm talking 15, maybe 20 different emails, is people listening to podcasts, in particular this podcast, at high speed. Yeah. And I had wondered, uh, you know, do people on, are they on Adderall? Is that why they have to listen to it at a, at a, at a higher speed? I can answer conclusively uh, that... People who listen to the show on high speed are not necessarily also taking Adderall or sim- similar amphetamine. However, people who are on an amphetamine, without fail in my minor poll, all of them listen at fast speed. And the uh, apparent optimum Adderall speed of this podcast is 1.75 times. <laughs> Sounds like a mosquito. I, and I got a lot of people talking about it and, you know, how it helps them. And it's really a miracle uh, for them, and which I, I, I don't want to take away any of that from anybody. And I, I, I'm sure if you need to get a test done, you take some speed. Yeah. Hell yeah, you get, you get it done. Well, <laughs> you're not going to do as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not. I'm not. This is probably why we get people that. Hey, what did you say about the? You know, what was the name of that again? You can't. Why don't you rewind it and then listen to yourself? Well, you, people ask for clarifications. People misunderstand us. Yeah, it's all because of this. Yeah. Anyway, one point seven five is. I, I, I was trying to think how can I do something with production or you know, can, maybe we should just release a faster version for everybody or just do this, just release it as faster for the Adderall generation. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is the No Agenda Show, the podcast for the Adderall generation. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's just, just a thought, just a thought. So we have a couple of things going on. Uh, there's some meme changes. Are you done with Hillary? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, well, first of all, Haley, Nikki Haley resigned, which brought up yes. a bunch of speculation about her being the one behind the memo. But yeah, I don't think so. And I don't think so either. And it, uh, I heard know, a, she did bitch and moan about Trump early on, but she didn't, you know, I don't think so. Yeah, but, but here, let's here's the rundown. This is a democracy now rundown on Haley resigning. Nikki Haley, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, has announced she's resigning her post at the end of the year. The former South Carolina governor was one of the few women in Trump's cabinet. She gave no reason for her departure. What was that Haley made the surprise. <laughs> There's plenty of cabinets with no women. Yeah, but this is democracy now, which you single-handedly support in this cabinet, which you single-handedly support. They have DeVos. They have the woman as the head of Homeland Security. They have Nikki Haley. How Maybe about Gina, Gina Haskell? Gina Haskell from CIA. That's another one. Well, she's not in the cabinet, though. I don't oh, think. right. No. The, uh, and, but there's that other, that Chinese woman. And that just. The Chinese the, woman? Yeah, there's a Chinese woman that's the, the wife of, uh, what's his name? The uh, Speaker of the House, that guy. He's got a 
she's Asian. I don't know if she's Chinese. She's we think about five women in this cabinet. Anyway, go on, just keep playing. I, Nikki I just, Haley, I, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, has announced she's resigning her post at the end of the year. The former South Carolina governor was one of the few women in Trump's cabinet. She gave no reason for her departure. Haley made the surprise announcement at the White House Tuesday alongside President Trump. During her remarks, she praised the president for pulling out of the Iran nuclear deal and for being a close ally to Israel. But I'm most excited. Look at the two years. Look at what has happened in two years with the United States on foreign policy. Now the United States is respected. Countries may not like what we do, but they respect what we do. They know that if we say we're going to do something, we follow it through. And the president proved that, whether it was with the chemical weapons in Syria, whether it's with NATO, saying that other countries have to pay their share. I mean, whether it's the trade deals, which have been amazing, they get that the president means business and they follow through with that. But then if you look at just these two years at the U.N., We've cut $1.3 billion in the U.N.'s budget. We've made it stronger. We've made it more efficient. South Sudan, we got an arms embargo, which was a long time coming. Three North Korean sanctions um, packages, which were the largest in a generation, done in a way that we could really work towards denuclearizing North Korea. Um, the Iran deal, bringing attention to the world that every country needs to understand. You can't overlook all of the bad things they're doing. You have to see them for the threat that they are. Um, I think you look at the anti-Israel bias and the strength and courage that the president showed in moving the embassy and showing the rest of the world, we will put our embassy where we want to put our embassy. During Nikki Haley's time as U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, the United States withdrew from the Paris Climate Accord, the U.N. Human Rights Council, the Iran nuclear deal, UNRWA, the U.N. agency that provides humanitarian aid to Palestinians, and UNESCO, the U.N. Educational and Cultural Agency. The Trump administration also threatened to sanction judges on the International Criminal Court if it went after Israel or the United States for war crimes. And the U.S. refused to sign the Global Compact on Migration a set of non-binding rules for safe, orderly and regular migration. While Nikki Haley did not say why she was resigning, she dismissed speculation she'll be running for president in 2020. Yeah. I don't see what the yeah, big deal a little, is. A little couple of stabs at the end. Yeah, yeah. Be, it's it's like, yeah. It was all globalist crap. Um, Lionel had a, a funny bit on her. Lionel oh, from I'd RT. Hear Lionel. I haven't heard him for a while. Nikki Haley always gave me the impression, whenever I heard her, she sounded like the assistant principal reading the lunch menu on the speaker. You know, in the morning, I'm going to read this paper, and I don't know what it means. I'm just going to read it. Good morning, school. Today, we have fish sticks and tater tots. <laughs> I think he nailed that one. <laughs> That's good. I'll give you that one. Give you a borderline clip for that, actually. Oh, thank you. That's, I don't really deserve it. It's one of our producers made that. Oh, I so they had a, um, you know, somebody come, well, it's because, you know, Haley hates Trump. And, and after the Kavanaugh thing, she quit. But it turns out that she actually told Trump six months ago that she was going to yes, quit. That's what I, yeah, she, that's what I heard, too. Yeah, so that's bull crap. So here's who's taken over. It looks like it's going to be Dina Powell. That's that's the best estimate everyone has. And they keep running her out there. It's kind of a flyer. All of a sudden, I never heard of this woman. Now she's in the news every which way. Donald Trump also said one possible candidate is Dina Powell, an Egyptian-born Goldman Sachs executive and Trump's former deputy national security advisor. Powell said to be close to the president as well as his daughter Ivanka and her husband Jared Kushner. While at the White House, Powell focused in part on U.S. relations with Israel in Saudi Arabia. She attended President Trump's first meeting with the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, uh, Mohammed bin Salman. NBC reports she was also involved with overseeing a $200 billion arms deal between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Hmm. So she looks like a shoe-in because she's a yeah. sales girl. Yeah, from, from the Goldmans. From the Goldmans. Yeah. Well, that's, that's that what that it is, brings- right? That's, it's a sales job. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, of course it is. All most of these jobs are sales jobs. I, the way know, one, we do. One of the our, way we do, we're a company of businessmen. One of our producers was saying and trying to get in an argument, which I don't do. Um, said no, this is uh, this was a deal with uh, the Republicans to push Kavanaugh through only if Haley resigned. 
What? Yeah, to me, that sounded like a pretty bad deal. Supreme Court justice for getting getting rid of the almost ceremonial role of you know, a sales job. Yeah. I mean, there's plenty of salespeople. Who comes up with this stuff? Oh, one of our producers. And he was like, I can't wait to hear what you guys talk about. I was like, nah. I just I don't think it doesn't make any Let's sense. Let's try to keep it within the realm of possibility. Yeah. But it does bring us to the Khashoggi thing. Ah, Khashoggi. Now, Khashoggi is a very famous name. Khashoggi is, uh, and he is directly related to Adnan Khashoggi, who was probably one of the most famous and uh, at the time richest arms dealers from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Uh, rumored to be worth about $4 billion at one point. And this guy is, ve- you know, the reason why I know this is I looked into him because, you know, they say, well, this is really important. It's a Washington Post reporter, Washington Post columnist, Washington Post, wapa, 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 wapa. I'm like, that little too much wapo. Yeah, I agree. You know, well, I, ha- I have a quick rundown that you yeah, can go that's into good. what you discovered. Uh, what is Saudi it? journalist NBC rap. Tonight, new images on Turkish television released by authorities there, showing an alleged 15-man Saudi hit team arriving in Shit. Istanbul what? on two yeah. private planes, then leaving their hotels. Their suspected target, a Saudi dissident, Washington Post writer Jamal Khashoggi, last seen Khashoggi. entering the Saudi <laughs> consulate in Istanbul Khashoggi. the same day. Some That was pretty funny. Khashoggi? Isn't it Khashoggi? I mean, that's what I've always... Yeah, it's Khashoggi. 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 A Saudi dissident, Washington Post writer Jamal Khashoggi, last seen <laughs> entering the Saudi consulate in Istanbul the same day. Some Turkish officials tell NBC News they believe he was killed inside. Today, the White House demanding answers from the Saudi rulers after an emotional appeal from his fiance. We're in contact with her now, and uh, we want to bring her to the White House. It's a very sad situation. It's a very bad situation. And we want to get to the bottom of it. Khashoggi is a leading critic of Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the young leader closely allied with the president and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Kushner, National Security Advisor John Bolton, and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo have all talked to the Crown Prince about Khashoggi as pressure builds for answers. If this man was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, if it did happen, they would be held to pay. The Saudi leaders denying any involvement in the journalist's disappearance. So, um, without going too in-depth into a lot of this, I can just kind of um, abstract it all into... Initially, I was thinking, well, somebody wants some kind of conflict with Turkey. And, you know, we, or maybe we want some kind of conflict with Saudi Arabia. And the further I get into it, it looks like, and let's wait for the bills to hit the floor or to be proposed or become public. I think they're looking for some kind of Magnitsky-type act against Saudi Arabia. Someone is trying, you know, Trump is buddies. There's a whole bunch of reasons for that, although in the global warming segment, we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, But that's what I, you know, Magnitsky Act is where you can just kind of have a bill that says these guys can't come in here. Well, there's a number of fishy aspects to this. Why do you need 15 guys to kill a guy? It, this, it, to me, it's all fabricated. The way this is told and I explained, think it is too. I it's think fabricated. the whole thing is fabricated. And and why would you do it in a council if you want to assassinate the guy? It doesn't seem like a great place. <laughs> no. Now, MI6 supposedly came in with their analysis. Did you, hear, this- did you hear that supposedly they, they killed him, chopped him up into little bits? And yeah, then and they ca- carried him out carried of his suitcases. <laughs> Suitcases dripping with blood, I guess. I have no idea. <laughs> so they sent 15 guys in to get him in the council. They trick him to going in there for some paperwork. His girlfriend and fiance with her brother and a couple other people are outside waiting. Why don't they go in with him? He's just going in to get some paperwork. Yeah. You can go into councilors. You can go in and out. Of course. So when doesn't she go in? No, 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 no. She's going to stay outside. So that doesn't make any sense. And so he goes in and then he, he never comes out, although we don't know that for sure. Maybe he came out disguised. Maybe there's a million things that could have happened. We don't know. We haven't seen all the footage. They say, well, he, well, he left. Well, there's no nothing to prove that. And then, but she's still outside. And the whole thing is so fishy. Well, also- and it makes no sense. You don't need 15 guys. And they keep making a point of that. And they came in in two private planes. Like, okay, <laughs> good for you. 
Uh, uh, let me let me give you some details on Khashoggi. By the way, I just want to mention this last thing. MI6, according to one other report, this thing that was in the Washington Post was who knows who was behind it. The guy who wrote it up was it does a lot of security stuff. Mm. Uh, the MI6, but oh no, they grabbed him. They're going to do a rendition. I don't know how they're going to get him out. They're going to do a rendition. So they injected him with something to knock him out and it killed him. That's the one. That's the one. The MI6 interpretation. Because it makes because it makes so much sense. Well, yeah. I'll, t- I'll tell you why they're mad at him. He did flee the country, Saudi Arabia. Uh, let me see. In December 2016, the Independent, citing a report from Middle East Eye, said Khashoggi had been banned by Saudi Arabian authorities from publishing or appearing on television for criticizing U.S. President-elect Donald Trump. Khashoggi also criticized Saudi-led blockade against Qatar. Um, Khashoggi has followed Osama bin Laden's career since the 1980s, had interviewed him several times. He knew bin Laden during his formative years as a radical Islamist. The whole, both families were are intertwined. Uh, interviewed him in Afghanistan in 87 uh, during the fight against the Soviet troops. He also met bin Laden in Tora Bora, and the last time was in Sudan in 1995. It is reported Khashoggi once tried to persuade bin Laden to quit violence. Uh, uh, Can you quit violence? Yeah. Quit violence. Yeah. But I think I, that I, this is clearly someone pushing against the Saudis. And if you know what? When we get to the global warming segment, it could easily be Trump himself who wants to. I mean, although this seems a little far fetched for even him to, to come up with something like this. But there's, there's a lot at play with the Saudis at the moment. But first, I'd like to thank you for your courage to say in the morning to you. The man who put the C in Cracker, John C. Devore. In the morning to you, Mr. Adam Curry. In the morning to all ships at sea, boots on the ground, feet in the air, subs in the water, and all the dames and all the knights out there. And in the morning to everybody in our troll room. Hello, trolls. Noagendastream.com, <coughs> where you can, <coughs> excuse me, we can listen live. We got our uh, troll room right there. You don't even have to identify yourself. You can be completely anonymous. Be a troll. Come on by the troll room. Be a troll. And we want to thank... Be a troll, be a troll. All the world loves a troll. I want huh? a little hint there for somebody. <laughs> In the morning to Martin JJ. Good to have that name back on my list. Martin JJ has created many fine pieces of artwork and saved the show in many ways with his always running backup recording systems when something breaks down in the studio. By the way, that's only happened on Mac so far. Um, Martin did the artwork for episode 1075. The title of that was CIA Paid Me. And this was nice. It was, uh, man, we had a lot to choose from again. Um, but this was the little icon for the Smart News app, which we laughed about their commercial. And he incorporated the No Agenda logo and read on, wrote on it, really smart news. And it was just, it was a pretty piece. It made a lot of sense. And it was great to have Martin JJ back on the list. And we thank all of our... Uh, artists, uh, we love your artwork. Uh, it is a part of the value for value system. People like the recognition. Also, you know, throughout the network, our value network, we have um, noagendashop.com where the guys there are printing up t-shirts and mugs and other paraphernalia with this artwork and they split the profits, a third for the show, a third for them, a third for the artists. It's fantastic. Noagendaartgenerator.com. Again, highly appreciated. Hmm. And with that, we also... Um, get a lot of value from people who send us money to keep the show going. It's one of the main ways you can support the work. It's been working for 10, uh, 11 years. Are you still yes. looking for your spreadsheet? I can't stall much more than no, that. No, I'm not. I know I got the spreadsheet up, but I, the problem is I'm looking at this last, the, the anonymous one, it's the line, line nine, nine, and I'm trying to decide. Uh, oh, here it is. Okay. I, I'm, I'm set. I'm ready to go. Brandon Gamach is our top. Uh, so uh, he's the executive producer. Everybody else's associates, and he uh, or Gamache in Stanwood, Washington, three hundred thirty-three dollars and thirty-three cents. Greetings, grand creators of digital entertainment excellence. I hope this donation finds you in good health and spirit. On this day, 33 years ago, I was given the gift of life. And after 33 revolutions around the sun, I'm pleased to say that your 33 revolutions around the sun would be uh, 33 years. I am uh, pleased to say that yours is truly the best podcast in the parts of the universe I have been so blessed to observe. (laughs) 
Being that today is my 33rd birthday, I thought it only fitting to celebrate my involvement with the new agenda cult of consciousness with a 333.3330 donation and offerings of fentanyl and four loco for the round table menu. <laughs> what is four loco? I don't know. I, a fentanyl, I know, but fentanyl and four loco? Uh, it's something in Washington they sell up there. I have no idea. <laughs> It's something they sell up I've there. I've never heard of Four Loco. Do you get that with your fentanyl? Is that typical? Or? I don't know. It doesn't sound healthy. <laughs> I'd like to give a shout out to my smoking hot girlfriend, Sky, who makes these arduous trips around the sun worthwhile. I want to thank you, John and Adam, for the hard work that you do, as well as the entire No Agenda community for everything they contribute, even all the douchebags. <laughs> No karma necessary, but I think a 33 is the magic number jingle would be a nice bow to top this gift. Cheers. Ah, nice way to celebrate your birthday. Thank you. You're also on the list for the segment. And the four loco is caffeine and malt liquor. Oh, huh. Thanks, troll room. 33, that's the magic number. Oh, it is. It's the magic number. You've got... Karma. John Boland in Brockport, New York, $250. And he says, thanks for meeting me for a great meal. Well, you're welcome. Was that to me or to you? Oh, I don't know. It must be, I I just, I don't don't remember Uh, meeting him for a meal. I don't remember. I don't know either. uh... Maybe it was the guy sitting at the table next to you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. He needs a don't eat me two to the head scream. Karma for Tina and her family. He must have met with you. Um, hold on. Oh, this is John. Yeah, he's been, no, he's been trying to meet with me. Uh, he's in Austin for a conference and it's just, you know, we've had a kind of a, with Tina's sister, we've had a lot of just, it's been a, it's, it's not been a meeting kind of week. So, oh, okay. so I haven't, uh, but he's, uh, I think he leaves today. So I, I apologize. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate the uh, support of the show. Don't eat me, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> You've got karma. Oh, you missed a two to the head. Oh, jeez. <laughs> there you go. Sir James of the Mountains, $314 Canadian. Happy belated Scandinavian Thanksgiving to my two favorite turkeys. Hey, oh, love and light. Goat karma, please. You've got <laughs> karma. I came with two hundred thirty-three dollars and thirty-three cents, and he claims that's three fourteen Canadian. Hmm. Well, wait a minute. If it's, it doesn't, he become an executive producer? Then isn't that part of our deal? That's what I'm thinking. So we'll bump him up. Okay, bumped up. Um, uh, Peter De Jong, two hundred three dollars and fifty three cents, and that is in Canadian. Spasm, and he uh, claims to be from Spasm. <laughs> I and like I it. said claims to be because his checking account doesn't reflect that. But okay, I occasionally do look at the MSM he writes, and I it always feels unhealthy. I fear that this donation will only serve to encourage you to, but if the show ends, I will miss the deconstruction humor and the OTG segments. Peter, $123.45 and eight oh oh eight in honor of Justin Trudeau, and he wants some respect. Okay, you could have told me that earlier. Respect. Okay, well, good. I, I Actually, I have a... Uh... I have an OTG, a little OTG segment for you. Does he need karma with that respect? We might as well. Yeah, right? give him some. R-E-S-P-I-C-T. You've got <laughs> karma. What an idiot. <laughs> uh, John Henry in F- Fajardo, Puerto Rico, $201. He actually sent also a second check. He sent a check for the uh, Ronald McDonald Foundation, which I'll forward to you. Oh, yes. He, he, he sent a very nice long note um, about Tina's uh, place of work, <clears throat> which actually was forwarded on to the CEO. It was really nice. Dear John and Adam, what does Justice Kavanaugh's dog say? <laughs> boof, boof. <laughs> Wow. Sorry for that horrible joke, but I couldn't resist. I've been a douchebag for too long, so here's $201 to start me on my next step, step to knighthood. Give him a de-douching. 
You got it. You've been de-douched. So the fitting wedding present will be the check to the Ronald's McDonald House in their name. I both wish them immense happiness forever. Can you please give a shout out to my business, changeover.com at www.changeover.com. In these times of a screaming economy and difficulty in hiring, reducing downtime is more important than ever. Cutting just 10 minutes of downtime per day adds an extra week of output, essentially for free. This is what to do. In addition, addition to being a knight, I am the changeover wizard. Hold on, what is it? Changeover? What was the name of that website? Changeover.com. Hmm. The shout out allows me to claim the donation as advertising. It may help to point this out as a way to increase donations. Interesting. Which, I we, think a lot of guys have been doing that. We changed downtime to uptime. A couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> you mentioned the Amazon was banning books like, like Bang Estonia <laughs> <laughs> as unsuitable. <laughs> yeah. The story of O. It's been called the most pornographic novel ever written and deals heavily with physical, sexual, and mental sh- about women as a good thing. I don't know what it is. So why is that book still deemed suitable for listing on Amazon? Oh, the story anyway, about... Oh, be- congrats to Amazon, to Tina and Adam for the... And keep up the good work. Thank you very much. He hopes to be listening in 2050. Me too. Uh, don't know yeah. what you'll be listening to, but I hope you're still listening. Sir John Zika is his name, he says to you. Ah, yes. Uh, all right, onward to uh, Jim Van Beveren. Jim Van Beveren. And he wrote a handwritten note. Uh, he came in with $201 also. And he has, uh, he's from Concord, California. He has a handwritten note. And it's very long. It's six pages. I'm only going to read some of it. I'll just read the beginning. John and Adam, I'm writing this letter in the observation car of the California Zephyr. Headed east to Chicago, then on to Boston. As I sit and write, I am surrounded by many wonderful, friendly Amish traveling companions. <laughs> Adam, talk about OTG. These people have mastered the art. Four days to cross the continent, I wanted to get a feel for my country. The whole country, not just the coasts. It's big. America's <laughs> big and empty. <laughs> By Bay Area standards, for sure. Overpopulated, posh, yet another myth. These people I've met on the train have been great. A cross-section of real America with a few Europeans for variety. Amtrak dining cars have tables that seat four bench seat style. So a couple of traveling across country will have new dining companions and varied conversations with every meal. This helps transition or transform the trip across the country into a journey. A land voyage on wheels of steel. (laughs) I know John would want at least a passing comment on the Amtrak dining experience. What can I say? Amtrak with a limited menu serves passable plastic cutlery cuisine. The wait staff is, however, pleasant and made the meals enjoyable. (laughs) Enough of that. On to business. This is my first donation. You give him a de-douching. Okay. <laughs> You've been de-douched. I could not stand being a freeloader. I could not stand being a freeloader any longer. How can one listen to the oh-so-entertaining donation segment and not donate? The hypocritical burden had become unbearable. <laughs> now, as a contributing member of the NA club, I'd like to throw my two cents in on the Dimension A, Dimension B dilemma. And he goes on with the exposition, and he says, he finally summarizes, the true split, he says the split's bullcrap, but the true split, the fundamental dichotomy is globalist versus nationalist. The fundamental tenet and cherished belief of each side being for the globalist equality, a justice for all, for the nationalist independence and self-reliance. Does he really talk like that all the time? Yeah. I believe that's what he talks. I believe he don't. I, I, I see. As a writer, I can pick up the voice. Ah, yes, this is one of your many talents. This is true. Yes, I can pick up the voice in the writing, and then I can kind of express it as best I can. I'm not a, I'm not great at it, but I think I come closer than most people. Anyway, he goes on, and uh, it's a very entertaining letter, and I appreciate all handwritten. It. Yes, all oh, handwritten with goodness. a pencil. Oh wow. Except once he his pencil broke and he used an ink pen for one page. <laughs> I'm going to give him a karma. Does he re- request anything specific? Well, let me look. You go to page 10. <laughs> I hear it. 
He wants a little girl yay and a listen to that train. Oh, that's interesting because I because he's a foamer, obviously. So I already had that all uh, all keyed uh, queued up for him. So yay! Oh my god! Oh, that's the Woo! goat foamer. Sorry. Listen to that goat. Sorry. <laughs> a wrong foamer. Yeah, that was a wrong foamer. I'm sorry. Here's the foamer we want. Oh my god! Woo! Listen to that horn. You've got there we go. karma. <laughs> Keep that letter. It's a good one. <laughs> Onward. Uh, Stephen Chanel. Chanel. I think Chanel. Schnuella. 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 Tennessee. Stephen Schnuell. Stephen Schnuell. I don't trust that my fellow team we eat and teammates will follow through and donate. If they don't, please double up on the douchebag call out. Well, so what do I do? All right. Give me a douchebag. Oh. Douchebag. By the way, the national comments from last week were a little ahead of the curve curve yes there are dimension b up talkers riding scooters everywhere but we still use restrooms and we don't have to watch our step while walking on broadway hey in your future my friend poop on the streets in your future if there's scooters there's poopers (laughs) it's the no no agenda rule if there's scooters there's poopers uh, anonymous is two hundred dollars. That, that Stephen was two hundred, and this is two hundred. And his, he did send an email in. Uh, I'm trying to see how long this. Also, it's actually it's like the beginning. It's like a book proposal. This thing, mm. but I'll read some of it. Uh, the trigger for those uh, for this note and donation was due to your great last episode and analysis about millennials being hooked on Insta. Mm-hmm. Is this the note you read earlier? No, 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 no. And it's called, as it's called, as it's called in Sweden, it's called that here too, yes. and Adderall, and subsequently smoking weed during nighttime to yeah, be able to, to go sleep to sleep. just yes. wind yeah. down. Yeah. Okay. I do definitely think there is something to it. And even though I never used Insta, I will share my similar experience. I've had this habit with Armodafinil. Oh, it's Armodafinil. another, another it's fine the, product. <laughs> But you get that stuff is actually a lot easier to deal with and weed for about four years at the end of my university studies and in the beginning in my qualified work life. Uh, Although armadaphanol has been a lot less euphoric and is a lot longer half life, the addiction potential is nowhere near that of Adderall, which I have not had the pleasure to indulge due to it. As far as I know, seems to be very illegal everywhere except in the United States. Hey, oh, yeah. Maybe if a European pharmaceutical company had the patent, things wouldn't be, it wouldn't, would have been different. Yeah. But hello. The <laughs> downside is the lack of a kick and euphoric effect was that, well, I w- excelled at work and was able to come down in the evening. My social life and skills and interests thereof were, de- were deteriorating. I was happy to tell you I'm almost all a year, I'm a year free from abusing weed and now only do it occasionally with friends in a healthy manner. I still do use and love armadaphanol, although uh, I think it is a wonderful nootropic, which is a brain stimulator thing, and I have jokingly convinced myself that I am self-medicating ADHD, which does seem to be the new black amongst my generation. Huh. There you go. I do not know everyone shares the same positive experience with armadaphanol or modafinil as I do, and it affects people differently. I do recommend people to try it. If you do, This is the stuff that the Air Force pilots use yeah. to stay alert. So if anyone wants to, it's the modafinils are, is the one we use in the United States. Um, contributing to my ease, silence for months at least, I do not abuse weed and sex to do good, blah, blah, blah. I've appreciated your increased reporting of Sweden in recent shows, and even though I felt the need to get out to escape the social and cultural climate that ensured economical decline in my home country, I still do love some parts of it and hope it all ends in the best possible way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now that you mentioned it, it is funny. I'm yeah, still a slave to the t- Swedish tax authorities and hope to solve this by establishing myself someplace long term next year. Hmm. I like a call out to my brother Oscar and friend Max as douchebags. Douchebag. 
I also would like some uh, some delayed fuck cancer for Max. He calls him a douchebag, and then he wants some delayed fuck cancer karma. Mm. And uh, realize his donation will tip me over the night. And, oh, hmm, I don't think we have him on the knighthood thing. Oh, wait. He's, he's a knight? I said this re- donation will tip me over to knighthood, and I would like to be knighted as Sir Antonoma, Antonymous. Okay, hold on a second. T O N Y M O U S of Seville Land. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to put this now. This is problematic. Oh no, I, I got I, it in there. He's on the list. I would have normally. I didn't read the whole note. He's on the list. He's on the list. Somehow Eric got him on the list. Good. Eric got him on the list. He's on the list. Oh, hey, I man. think I sent Eric this note just to read. But he's not with the plus one. It's a plus one. Uh, last but not least, I've been thinking about how I should celebrate sending my first invoice to a client. I am currently thinking about treating myself with either an Oakland A's cap. As I regret, I left mine in Sweden. Mm. Uh, Intel NUC to play with and maybe build a travel server router. Or two Thai bar girls. <laughs> we have a winner. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think the bar girls are probably a better that's bet. The, especially that's the way to go, go my friend. Hat. <laughs> I could go on longer, but you get the point. I found it worthwhile. I hope you found this a worthwhile read. He's got the accounting in here, and then uh, I don't see any requests. So just give him a karma, and it will be done. Oh, and he wants an F cancer karma. Oh, F cancer yes. karma, right. Sorry. Okay. That's y- what he wants. Yes, happy to do that. Fucking cancer! Fucking cancer! You've got karma. And we want to thank all these folks for being our executive and associate executive producers for show. Uh, 1076. Yes, titles that are completely valid anywhere that titles are recognized. Certainly these types of credits, executive producer, associate executive producer of episode 1076 of the No Agenda Show. And thank you very much. Really appreciate that, everybody. Also for what you, the notes, it's, uh, I learn a lot from this segment. Hear that? People who skip it? Oh, wait. Hey, by the way, do people who are on Adderall and listen at 1.75 speed still skip the donation segment? I don't know that they're paying attention to anything. (laughs) Remember, we have another show coming up on Sunday. Please go and support us at Dvorak.org slash N-A. And it is National Hispanic Heritage Month on NFL. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. Should have said ESPN. You know, ESPN. 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 Um, I don't play clips from Scott Adams' <clears throat> Periscope because it's a, he t- tends to have a. It's about a forty-five minute ramble, and they're hard to get anything concise out of there. But he does come up with some good stuff mm-hmm. once in a while. This particular one, I think you should p- promote it a little more. Uh, this is a funny idea that he got from Twitter and he talked about a little bit. I did take a lot of the spaces out, so it's a little tighter than it would normally be. But I want to play it because I just think this is a damn good idea. This is Scott Adams on Democrat gun control. Somebody on Twitter suggested that since the Democrats um, seem to have a temperament problem, and at the same time, the Democrats are anti-gun. All right, so put these two together. The Democrats are anti-gun. And they also seem to have a temperament problem because they're rioting and they're doing the cathartic theater thing. Uh, So somebody suggested that we pass a law that uh, Democrats can't own guns. (laughs) Now, the first time you hear that idea, passing a law that says Democrats can't own guns, the first time you hear that, you say to yourself, well, that's a ridiculous just joke idea. But here's what's so funny about it. If you're a Democrat, don't you believe that some gun control is better than none, right? (laughs) So if you were to say to a Democrat, let's just be completely rational here. Republicans will never give up their guns. But you believe, you Democrats believe, that more guns is worse and more people with guns is worse. So why don't we start somewhere where we we can all agree? Let's just start where we all agree. We all agree that if you're a registered Democrat, you shouldn't have a gun. Now, would Democrats disagree with gun control for Democrats? It's an interesting argument, isn't it? Because on one hand, it's ridiculous on its on its surface because you don't make laws that only affect 
some people who have you know voluntarily signed up to be in a party. You know, you don't do that. But on the other hand, it's what they want. Huh? I'm all in. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's it's funny, but I don't know. I don't know. It seems like a good idea to me. <sighs> well, so that means you can't own a gun as a registered Democrat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Then I'm all for it. To the gate, to the gate, to the climate gate. Oh, so good to have that one back on the radar. Your favorite little birdies there, John. I have a, don't forget, I have at least two, maybe three clips about this. Uh, well... Yes. Uh, so I, I did something I don't normally do, but I did listen to the one clip you have about the price tag, and I definitely uh, want to incorporate that. But Well, I, you know what it is. You can just incorporate it. I'm going to. What, what are your other oh, ethanol? The other one is I want, to, I, have a, uh, I want to talk about Hurricane Michael a little bit. Oh, no. Well, well, oh, okay. Let's do that first because I have to say – with this IPCC special report, which came out just before Hurricane Michael even, I think, even existed, it came out so quickly, I was very surprised scanning the, the news uh, during the hurricane that it really, ha- I mean, maybe it started now, today, but no one was really connecting it to the IPCC report, which to me seemed obvious as this storm was created by harp or some other entity it seemed obvious <laughs> well state of fear go read michael Crichton's state of fear this is completely that script like well how come they're not saying this over and over and over again i'm very surprised by that so let's talk about michael then well here's the clip the short roundup of 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 CBS. I have one comment about it and you can take the rest of it. Good evening. I'm Jeff Glor in Panama City Beach, Florida, and this region just endured one of the worst hurricanes in American history. The worst hurricane to ever hit the Florida Panhandle. The worst hurricane to ever hit the United States in the month of October on record. Tonight, the rain is basically gone in this region, but the wind is still here with us. You can see power lines down behind us. Power poles down just across the street here. There is the side ripped off a building. That is a scene we are seeing all across this region tonight. Okay. Here's what gets me. Now, if you remember the last hurricane, the one that drenched North Carolina. Yes. This hurricane comes in. It's like a four, it's a five, and it sits, it stops at the coast and then turns into a zero tropical storm and just dumps like three feet of water on everyone. Mm -hmm. The hurricane before that was the one that hit Houston, which was the same thing. Oh, it's going to be a, it's going to destroy everything. It comes in, it stops at the coast and dumps three feet of water on everything. Right. And so then. A expert a climate guy comes on and says, this is the new hurricane. This is the new hurricane. Oh, what they're the going to do hurricane. because of the way the temperature here and the temperature there, they're going to come in. And when they hit the, the, the land, they're going to stop and they're going to dump all this moisture they picked up from the warm water that went into the hurricane. And it comes down and down and down and just soaks them. Now, this particular hurricane, it should have been the same thing. It comes in at a five. I expected to stop. No, no, it doesn't drop seven feet of water just blows through and goes on its merry way. I was told <laughs> after the North Carolina event by these global warmest guys this is the new hurricane. that this was going to be the way it was going to be for all these hurricanes. They're all going to be swamped with water. Jeff Glor is standing there in a completely dry area. The, t- the telephone poles were all bent, yes, and it was pretty funny looking. And, but there was cars going up and down like nothing had happened. Yeah, I I was just listening to the coverage and Brian Williams on MSNBC got into a long rant about, you know, how sometimes it looks strange because, you know, we're we're standing in the storm without reporting and people just walking by in the background. But that's because you don't see off the shot that they're working behind a building. And, you know, my question is, why are you there at all? I don't need you don't need to stand there. I don't need Jeff Glore standing in this town. No, I don't. We do not need Jeff Glore standing in any town. The thing that uh, gets me is we really build shitty houses in America. And these are shit homes. 
And I'm surprised they're getting insurance at all. You have to have strapped down roof, all kinds of stuff in Florida. Maybe the panhandle for some reason, maybe they thought that wasn't necessary. But I'm, I think all of the whole state of Florida, you have to have all kinds of you know, hurricane proof windows. But beside all that, just, we just build really crappy overpriced houses made of wood. You, know, so you have to do that in California. Your, your houses have to be built of wood. Uh, or because they of will the weight? fall apart if there's one little earthquake. Ah, is that the same? I guess Florida's the same then. Not, not for earthquake, but marshy swampland, maybe. I don't know, but they're crappy uh, well, houses. Yeah, you, well, if it's marshy swampland, you probably don't want so much wood. I did notice this. They showed one of the houses that did have us blown up a little bit. I mean, at least half the house was missing. Yeah, and they showed it. It was interesting because the the foundation, not, not the the structure, the inner structure of the house was not two by fours or four by fours or two by twos or anything else. It was metal. Hmm. I thought that was what they're building the end. So the structure was metal. Huh. I thought it was weird. But metal on a the structure was metal. The, in other words, the the, the frame, frame, the frame, the inside oh. frame of the house hmm. appeared to be made out of metal. This uh, kind of uh, like these little mini beams. Hmm. Huh. Well, uh, of course, there's many reasons to think climate, this climate change, what used to be called global warming, is a bunch of hahui. Uh, we both are on the side of hahui. For well, a, we're both on the side of, oh, no, there's climate change. No, it's change. climate we're change. That's not man-made. No, it's cyclical and it's just happening. And... The I think our my biggest grievance is the idea that you can fix this with money. That's the that's the problem. That's what bothers me. Now I do understand, and I really became first became aware of this report the minute it hit. A uh, Dutch member of European Parliament, Marijke Schalke, who was just a tone deaf douche. She's like, oh, we we have so much to do, so much work to do. And and I realized that particularly, and I listened to a number of. Um, a European news channels, were, and the Dutch one is easier for me. I can really get all the nuance. And they had politician after politician. And you can hear that they're also kind of happy because this report, just globally speaking, uh, says we have to forget the two-degree warming. Oh, no. No, no, no. We have to get it down to one and a half degrees, and we got to do it pretty soon, and it's going to cost a lot of money. And you can just hear these politicians are all, they're all jacked up. They're like, oh, yeah. We can spend some money. We're going to spend some money. It's it's what they live for. They don't even and, realize and, it, but that's what they live and, for. And you want to point out that we're not talking – when there's that clip that I have, which you're going to play. We're not talking about nickel and dime stuff Oh, no. Stuff but here. Your clip only scratches the surface, but it's, it's a great starting point for, for the calculations I've come up with. Um. I think the best lead in to this is the BBC, who just had a word salad of beautiful fear about this report. Uh, this is the lead in and background. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that some joined up thinking has been taking place, or perhaps it's just by far the most important issue of the day the existential threat to us all <gasps> posed by climate change. I just, you, you talk through it. I just want to reiterate what she said the existential threat to our soul, John. Our soul. It's by far the most important issue of the day, the existential threat to us all posed by... Oh, no, it's all. I'm sorry. I thought you said soul. To us all. To us all. It's an existential threat to us all. So we're all going to die. To thinking that some joined up thinking has been taking place, or perhaps it's just by far the most important issue of the day, the existential threat to us all posed by climate mm. change. On the day the Nobel Prize for Economics is awarded to two men for their work on climate change and innovation, Professor William Nordhaus and Paul Romer, we're seeing the publication of a major UN report on the subject. The report says that society must enact unprecedented changes on how people live to prevent catastrophic changes to the planet. It comes from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and says dramatic changes are needed to, uh, on energy consumption, travel, building methods and the food that we eat. Let's speak to Matt McGrath, who's our environmental environment correspondent. He joins us from uh, Incheon in South Korea, which is where the report was, was published. Uh, Matt, just outline for us the kind of dramatic key messages of this report. 
Yeah, Rossi, there's uh, two key points really about this report. The first is that keeping temperatures to 1.5 degrees is far, far better for the planet than getting, <laughs> allowing them to go to 2 degrees, which has been the standard up to now. So they're talking about things like coral reefs, they're talking about millions of people being flooded. All those are actually much, much better if they're kept to 1.5 degrees rather than allowing them to go to 2 degrees. The other big point in this report is that it is still possible to keep to 1.5 degrees ah. if the world takes major steps such uh-huh. as cutting major. emissions by 45%. In- I just want, you know, we gloss over this type of reporting. Again, it is the BBC who are taken seriously. You- yes? I wish you want to mention something. We've been doing this show for almost 11 years. We're coming on 11. Yeah. Every year we've been doing this show, this was the point of no return. <laughs> Every year, it's the point of no return. Children in the and UK will never the see literature, snow. It was the point of no return in the 70s. Tipping point. Tipping point. Yeah, tipping point, if you yeah. want to use that phrase. Same thing. What happened to peak oil? What happened to the... <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Whatever happened to peak oil? Whatever happened to the DACA kids, for that matter? <laughs> yeah. Well, they're apparently doing the oil fields pumping oil. Uh, let's just go back. So th- we gloss over it, but I think some people still get the overall message, which is millions die, millions migrate, horrible storms die, death. Oh, soon, going to die, death. But you can be saved as long as you have enough money. That It is still possible to keep to 1.5 degrees if the world takes major steps, such as cutting emissions by 45% in the next 12 years, <laughs> dispensing with coal as a power source altogether. <laughs> Okay, uh, 45% of all emissions uh, and no more coal at all. And boosting renewables massively and actually getting people to change their lifestyles. Plus, on top of all that, we're going to need carbon removal technology to remove carbon from the atmosphere. Carbon removal technologies. What are these carbon removal technologies, John? Well, they're called trees. The Plant question. more trees and you'll, you'll get plenty of carbon re- uh, removal. I, I take it differently. What is the number one source of carbon? Well, does he say carbon or carbon dioxide? Hold on. Plus, on top of all that, we're going to need carbon removal. Te- yeah, see, this pisses me off. Carbon is not causing global warming. Carbon dioxide is causing global warming. Carbon dioxide is not causing no, global warming. According to no, not, I'm not. I'm not telling you this for a fact. I know that. I'm saying that is what the report says. The report doesn't say carbon is causing it. No, it's carbon dioxide. Right. So, I think he's just um, abbreviating this to say carbon. It's part of the propagandistic ploy. Because the number one thing to remove if you want to remove carbon is humans. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Getting people to change their lifestyles. To the lifestyle of dead. Plus, on top of all that, we're going to need carbon removal technology to remove carbon from the atmosphere. The big question in all this, though, is time. Now, I've been ah, speaking to Professor Jim Ski. He's one of the co-chairs of the IPCC. And I asked him how long policymakers have got to take action. Well, they really need to, to start work, work immediately. I mean, the, uh-huh. the report is clear that if governments only just fulfil the pledges they made after the Paris Agreement for 2030, it's not good enough. It will really make it, 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 will really, really, really make it very difficult to consider a global warming of 1.5. If they go to Poland, they read the report, and they decide to increase their ambitions and act more immediately, then 1.5 stays within reach. That's the nature of the choice they face. Oh. That's Professor Jim Ski there speaking earlier on about the uh, nature of this report and what actions governments might take. And one of the things that might prevent governments from taking action, of course, is costs. The report says it's going to cost 2.5% of global GDP over a period of about 20 years. So we'll see later down the road if governments will actually take the lessons of this report or whether they'll balk at the overall expense. Uh, so... The uh, apparently we have 12 years and I will remind everyone that we started we dropped the climate change or global warming moniker many, many years ago and went for Agenda 2030 because we knew that 2030 is a year that is the is in the the sweet spot for someone my age uh, and even a little bit younger, because that's when you'll be thinking about all the children and. You know, it's really your your end of life, and I need to do something to save the world. So it's been targeted specifically to get to people who still have some money, if you got any money at all. Um, and uh, 
uh, they had a little announcement. They had a little uh, a little get together to uh, celebrate this report, and I, I pulled three short clips from this just so we can understand what this really is. Now, this is a special report. This is not some report that they've worked on for decades and decades. It's a special, like an interim report, but it has a very specific goal, and uh, the leader of this uh, little speech explains it to us. This report is a rich resource for governments formulating climate policy. There you go. That's what this whole report is for. It's a rich resource for governments forming climate policy. And we've given you a lot of great things in here. Areas, climate policy areas that are affected by climate change and a key input into coming climate negotiations. My colleagues will share the key climate findings. Nego- who are you negotiating with? Oh, yeah. Oh, no. This is negotiations. It's everywhere. This is your future. Climate carbon taxes, all these with negotiations. Who, negotiate with who and why? Everybody. Who are you negotiating with? For the, the money. The water? For the money. For the, the money. ocean? For the money. The negotiating with other countries to get the money. Coming climate negotiations. My colleagues will share the key findings with you in a very short minute of time. Let me give you the highlights. First, climate change is already affecting people, ecosystems, and livelihoods all around the world. Not my mud flat. Second, <laughs> limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is not impossible, but will require unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society. Third, there are clear benefits to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to 2 degrees or higher. Every bit of warming matters. Now, this is this is what's interesting. This every bit of warming matters is their slogan. You're going to be hammered with it because clearly after the United States withdrew, or I'll just say President Trump withdrew from the climate, from the Paris Climate Accord, um, the, the climate change community has been, you know, in flux. We need to create something that really shows we're all going to die and we need to get this green economy, circular, sustainable economy, all these fuzzy words, which, I, I mean, I understand if you want to start a new economy and you want to base it on, you know, some stuff that may or may not work and so far has proven to be pretty cost inefficient because uh, it, it helps. It helps, you know, we have economies change all the time. We have a, a technology economy to some degree, but you do need to have some basics and, you know, just just to be scaring people into this to, so that you as elites can go spend money and save people other where or whatever, whatever it is, it's insane. It's really insane. And you can see that these are just a bunch of douchebag elites when you listen to the second speaker. So this is the guy who opened up, gives you some highlights. The second speaker from working group two, there's three working groups apparently. Uh, this is what she says right off the bat. Oh, why is this not playing? Here we go. Hmm. Hey. <sighs> With that, I would like to hand over to Valerie, the working group co-chair. Working group co-chair one. Oh, one. Thank you, Hosung. Before we get on to presenting the findings of the special report on 1.5 degree global warming, I'm proud to unveil the draft cover page of this special report. An artist created the piece of visual art on this front cover, having been inspired by a scientific figure in the summary for policymakers. Perhaps you can recognize it. This is so typical where they hired an artist, some, some, actually some semi-well-known guy, to create the cover for this report. I've seen this so many times. This is douchebaggery of the highest order. And again, it's all about one simple slogan. Moving on to the second section of the SPM, which deals with projected climate change, potential impacts and associated risks. Models project robust differences in climate sound engineer. <laughs> between present day and global warming of 1.5 degrees and between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. Every bit of extra warming makes a difference. All right, so that's, that's what it's all about. Every bit of global warming, every temperature, every degree makes a difference. You'll hear, hear variations of it. So now I'm going to play your global warming clip because it did have a little extra 
kicker there beyond just the GDP number. It's the biggest warning from the science community yet. A call for action. Where is this from, this clip? I thought it was from Democracy Now!, but I think it's from uh, one of the Euro news sources. The IPCC's report is clear. Urgent and unprecedented changes are needed to keep global temperatures from rising to unbearable levels. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is not impossible, but will require unprecedented transitions in all aspects of society. There are clear benefits to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to 2 degrees or higher. Every bit of warming matters. The 2015 Paris Agreement aimed at keeping a global temperature rise this century well below 2 degrees Celsius, above pre-industrial levels. But the IPCC's new report shows that the effects of global warming would already be disastrous with a 1.5 degree increase. 1.5 degrees would cause a rise in global water levels of about 48 centimeters. 56 centimeters if temperatures were to rise 2 degrees. The impact on the environment would be even more important. A rise in 2 degrees would cause the extinction of 18% of all insects, 16% of all plants and 8% of all vertebrates. Not to mention the effect on human populations. Limiting global warming to 1.5 compared to 2 degrees would reduce the number of people exposed to climate-related risks and susceptible to poverty by up to several hundred millions by 2050. Limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius comes with a hefty price tag. Some 2.1 trillion euros would have to be invested every year for 25 years. (laughs) <laughs> so 2.1 trillion dollars a year in Europe no 2.1 trillion euros yeah, a year that's just for, for Europe 20 years are you kidding me no that's just for Europe according to the World Bank the global gross domestic products I guess everyone would participate if we're I, you can't just say yeah the Chinese and the Indians will not participate so right. let's start there but, but let's on. let's just say if they had to because we're all gonna die I mean someone's got to go over there and kick their ass and tell them to pay up because it's all about the Benjamins. So the gross world product for 2015 was $74 trillion. That's $74,000 billion. Take 2.5% of that, you get $1.85 trillion. Multiplied by 20, $37 trillion. Well, this number was actually higher than that. That's for half a degree. Oh. That's for half a degree. <laughs> <laughs> so I read through the report. And I just have a couple of things that I uh, marked up, and I just wanted to... It, it's a very long report, and there's a lot of this high confidence. Yeah, we think so. Uh, Magic 8 Ball says, looks like it. You know, so this is, this is the kind of report. 91 specialist scientists wrote this report. Um, so th- th- throughout the entire uh, document, there's a lot of, you know, t- t- over and over they use the words experts, last chance, Carbon taxes, disaster, man-made, catastrophe. It's, you know what? I'm going to put it in the show notes. Someone needs to download this and do a word cloud on it. I want a word cloud of this report. You'll see. Experts, carbon taxes, disaster, man-made, catastrophe, last chance. Also, uh, they make it very clear, these experts, uh, that nuclear power is not the way to go. It is, quote, yes, this was the thing that kind of caught my attention. It is, quote, dirty and dangerous. And they are really pushing against that. You can't, you can't be doing that. Let's look at it from another perspective. If this is such a, and in fact, this is the argument I use if you get into an argument in a bar or at a uh, cocktail party. Do you want me to read some of the more? Because I I want to finish my thought. All right. To get into an argument in a bar. Okay. New supposedly dirty and dangerous when it's not um i mean it has elements of that but it's not dirty and dangerous the point is if we're all going to die <laughs> don't you think we should take the easiest way out and that seems to be uh, n- nuclear power they literally if, if we're all going to die they instead liter- of spending uh, trillions of dollars no no i mean no. come on no because proliferation of nuclear energy will be I'm, I'm telling you this is in the report will be too tempting for people to weaponize that that nuclear material 
Which is what bomb com- bomb their neighborhood? What are they talking about? Yeah, that, some that's what the experts are talking about. That's that's literally France in this is report. Duke powered. I know you, you don't have, look. I'm not in a bar and I'm not in an argument with you. <laughs> some other things I've noticed here. So in general, carbon dioxide emissions must reach net zero by 2050 in order to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. This is the the whole report is the 1.5 degree report. So they're really upping it all up and making you just worried. So to reiterate. Carbon dioxide use must fall by 45% by 2030. That's less than 12 years from now. Coal use will have to be reduced, quote, substantially by the middle of the century. And as you heard in one of our clips, the technology that removes carbon from the atmosphere is unavoidable. And I still don't really understand what carbon has to do with it. Um, If we fail to meet these goals and the earth warms by 2 degrees centigrade, according to the report, hundreds of millions of lives are at stake. So what they're saying is very interesting, that if we wait until the 2 degrees, so many people are going to die. But if we can only get to 1.5, and we're at 0.89 right now, according to some magical unicorn calculation, then millions of people will live Millions will live if only we can do this now. Uh, let's see, the 1.5 degree report, it has, yes, it's going to monumentally change our society. So, of course, in order to stop using coal and fossil fuels as a primary energy source by the middle of the century, we will transition to electric, solar, wind, and maybe just a little bit of remnants of nuclear, but also bio, bioenergy and biofuels. Uh, The report also says, limiting individual transportation, such as cars, airplane use, and shipping on a large scale, and improving access to electric transportation, public transit, and non-motor transit, like walking and biking, as well as restoring forests and non-human ecosystems, will need to happen at a large scale in order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. You know, poop, people are pooping on the BART train now. <laughs> I like the idea, large-scale planting of trees. Yeah, that will definitely reduce some carbon dioxide. They just kind of slipped that in. I mean, I didn't know that individual transportation includes planting large-scale trees. You know. Um, this is the uh, final quote from... What's her name? Skia. Skia. Anyway, finally, we've delivered a message to the governments. We've done our job. We've now passed the message on, and it's their responsibility, having invited us to re- produce this report, to decide if they're going to act on it, direct quote. They invited them to produce this report because they get all jacked up on spending money. Uh, let me see. Now, this 1.5 degrees, it's not, I mean, this was actually talked about in 2009 that they started to do, it's, it's kind of a throwback. I, I won't object if you wrap this pretty soon. Every w- bit of warming matters. Okay. Uh, this will just take me into two interview clips. About, uh, you know, because who's going to be impacted by this? It'll be people who produce oil. Uh, the Saudis are uh, getting hammered by Trump. Uh, what is gas price right there in uh, California at five bucks now? Uh, it's $3.75 for a premium. Oh, that's not too bad. I think we're, we're a 220 240 here, maybe? Yeah. Huh. Uh, that is because... 240 is better. <laughs> yeah, better than what you got for sure um christiana Amanpour had a and you never see this you barely, barely see these interviews uh interviewed the saudi foreign minister about what trump said about saudi arabia or i should say opec at the united nations which is in this clip as well did, did anyone talk about what he said during the un regarding opec was that in any news stories anywhere 
No, there was just, no, they were, there wasn't time for that because the, the world was laughing at him. Donald Trump launched a broadside at OPEC countries, he called them. Well, obviously, Saudi Arabia is the biggest OPEC country. And we're going to play a soundbite of what he said regarding high oil prices at the moment. OPEC and OPEC nations are, as usual, ripping off the rest of the world. And I don't like it. Nobody should like it. We defend many of these nations for nothing. And then they take advantage of us by giving us high oil prices. Not good. We want them to stop raising prices. We want them to start lowering prices. And they must contribute substantially to military protection from now on. We are not going to put up with it, these horrible prices, much longer. Well, I mean, Saudi Arabia, as I said, is the biggest and most powerful OPEC nation. Were you surprised by that? I mean, we're not going to put up with these horrible prices any longer and accusing OPEC of being responsible for these high prices. Uh, it wasn't surprising because the, the, the president has articulated this position before. Saudi Arabia is committed to balancing the oil markets. We're committed to ensuring that prices are at moderate levels so that consumers are not hurt and producers are not hurt. We have <clears throat> seen an increase in the demand for oil and we're going to see a reduction in the supply of oil by Iran and I think the markets are putting upward pressure on the price of oil. We have increased our oil production. We continue to increase our oil production to bring more oil to the markets so that we have moderate prices. You see production increases in the United States. You see production increases elsewhere. There's a commitment to uh, stabilize markets at prices that do not harm consumers or producers. This has been our policy for the last four decades, and we continue to explain this to our friends in the U.S. The price of oil began to increase when American shale production came down as a consequence of lower prices. Now American supply is increasing, and we're providing more supply to the market. With regards to the Iran sanctions, we are fully supportive of the president's policy on Iran. We believe it's the right policy, whether it involves withdrawing from the JCPOA or whether it involves imposing more sanctions on Iran to make Iran uh, comply with international laws and international norms and behavior. So we're fully on board with that policy. Right. So this is the foreign minister and he's full of crap. And I hate this. Well, you know, it's what the market wants. It's like we're trying to keep it balanced so it doesn't hurt producers, doesn't help, doesn't hurt consumers. It's all very hurtful. This is this is completely wrong. And I don't know if the if the um, uh, Saudi Arabia Magnitsky type act with the Khashoggi journalist ties into this at all it could be that we need to you know put these guys on notice. But I this led me to a clip from Dan Pena. Pena, remember this guy? Dan Pena is the oil guy. Uh, we had a clip from him uh, maybe a year ago, and he was just he was saying global warming is a scam because or. Yeah, global warming is a scam because if it was true, then you wouldn't be able to insure your home and uh, with Lloyd, you know, uh, for you know more than ten years. Otherwise, you know, why would they insure that? Remember that guy? Yeah, a very loud mouth, brash guy. He's he. This clip he explains the Saudis, the oil prices, and the reason we still have not seen the Saudi Aramco public listing. When I was in the energy business, and forevermore, I'm be an oil man. Oh yeah. By the way, he's. A little brash sometimes in his language use. Okay, you are an oil man. Well, an oil man. Everybody, everybody knew that when when uh, people will take more serious the global warming is when Aramco, Saudi, the kingdom, runs out of oil. Now, two years ago, Aramco, which is uh, the petroleum company of the Saudi uh, government, announced they're going to go public. This was when oil was twenty eight dollars a barrel. Now, why would smart guys, MIT kind of guys, say they're going to go public at the lowest oil price in the last 30, 40 years? Why? Why? Hmm. Because when you go public, and they're going to sell, they're going to sell 2% of the, the, the company off. Uh, when they go public, they have to report a reserve report, publish a reserve report, which means that for the first time, in the history since they discovered oil there, J. Paul Getty discovered oil there back 70, 80 years ago. They're going to know about plus or minus 10 percent how much oil the Saudis really have. Now, I'm here to tell you 
They have hundreds of trillions of barrels. They are never going to run out of fucking oil in your children's lifetime. Now, they've now pulled back and they've changed three times the date of the public offering. Three times in the last two years. Now, uh, 2019 looks good, but maybe, maybe not. We'll let the market dictate. Of course, oil is up from $25, $26 a barrel up to 65 ish more or less. Uh, and uh, the, um, they don't want to publish that number if they don't have to. The price I hear, the price the, the, uh, the, where the lines cross, supply and demand for Aramco, for the, the kingdom, is around $75 to $80 a barrel. Stabilized over two, three, four, five years, not one day. Okay, so I don't see one they're going to go public because if they do, they're going to have to tell what the reserves are. And you know what the price of oil is going to do when they say that there's 42 gazillion jillion barrels of oil? It's going to drop like a fucking stone. <laughs> I like that guy. Hello. Were you listening at all? Yeah, I heard him. No, you I heard every hour of that clip. Um, you know, I have are, a clip. Are you bored with this? I mean, we we rarely talk about global warming bullshit. There's a huge report, and you're just like harping on me. One, you want to fight me in the bar. Then you're like, now nah, it's taking too long. And then every hour I, of that I, clip. This is a very boring report. The science is in. Science. It was like half the show, and I didn't get anything out of it. They didn't already know, uh, except they're supposedly – this guy doesn't know how much their reserves are in Saudi Arabia. Maybe they're not that much. Uh, we have pretty good expertise on reserves of the oil companies. They all know what everybody else is doing. I'm skeptical about that guy. I do have one clip that kind of falls into place. No, you cannot do that. It's too boring. It's a short clip. My clip is it's boring. Only- 39 seconds 39 minutes of boring hit it Just, i don't know i don't know oh, what clip i don't know what clip it is you it really you, by the way you really you, you really now. piss me off with that that's okay don't worry about it oh, that's I, all commentary and democracy now are you commanding me to play something Say, no, please. I'm asking if you want to play it. President Trump has ordered the EPA to roll back limits on the amount of ethanol blended into gasoline in a move that will benefit big agribusiness companies. Trump announced the ethanol rule change at a campaign rally in Iowa Tuesday evening, where he appealed to his Republican base to turn out during next month's midterm elections. At the rally, Trump mocked California Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein, claiming she leaked a letter written by Professor Christine Blasey Ford alleging Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh tried to rape her when they were teenagers. Trump then laughed as his supporters chanted, lock her up, referring not to Hillary Clinton, but to Senator Feinstein. They don't know what they're referring to. So the question is, I thought ethanol was a big lifesaver. It's going to be the best thing ever since sliced bread. It was better for the environment, didn't give off so much carbon. So why are they presenting it in a negative light on democracy now? what i thought all right you're back no no please entertain us i'm just saying it just seems screwy to me yeah that they're condemning et- more production of ethanol when this is the guys these are the global warmists that want to see you know less and less carbon and now all of a sudden since trump's kind of wants to make more ethanol this is bad it's all seems about trump to me anyway yeah, on. tell me something I didn't know. All right, so I'll do something for the OTG segment to lighten the mood a little bit. See, another thing you bitch about. But, of course, I'm from the future, and that's why it now shows up on The Family Guy. Oh, looks like they really want me to come to that party. We're going to have to go. You, you have a pager? Yeah. You get paged? Yeah, that's how a pager works. Why don't you just get a phone? Um, you mean one of your government tracking devices? No thanks, I'm using a pager. Oh, you're looking at your steps? No, the government's watching where you're going. (laughs) It's not nap time, Stewie. Wake up. All right, we're out of here. Okay, Stewie's going to the party. Yeah, but where's Chris going? I have no idea. He's completely off the grid. Damn it, he can't hide forever. Where are you? Chris, isn't this 
cool? Stewie, don't say my name. There's an Alexa in here. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, we have eyes on Chris. He's at a douchebag vaping party. <laughs> Sooner or later, <laughs> they all get sloppy. I'm going to show my support by donating to No Agenda. Imagine all the people who could do that. Oh, yeah, that'd be fab. Yeah, oh, No Agenda. In the well, we do have a few people to thank for show 1076, starting with Sir Jim or Sir Jim Briscoe, uh, $151.51. Loves the shows recently, hasn't donated for a while. Too busily engrossed in making some money. Hmm. Uh, if you're making money, about us. Alex Talbert in Bozeman, Montana, 150 bucks. Uh, he's been a douchebag. For too long. Uh, give him a de-douching, please. You've been de-douched. And he, we'll give a, we need a, he needs a F karmic thing and we'll put that at the end for him. Antonio Sanchez Godinez, $120 from uh, Spain. Happy 60th birthday on October 9th and a big job, Karma. I believe he's on the list. I think so. Is he? Yeah, I yeah. think so. Craig Dennison in Omaha, $111.11. He sent a note card, like a huge card, uh, telling us how great we were. And I, of course, put the card down somewhere. There it is. It's a big, giant card. It says 11. Think of it being one, number one twice over. It's a big 11th birthday card, uh, which I thought was kind of cute. It's been just over a year since I last donated, so uh, can I be de-douched? Oops. Yep. You've been de-douched. Apparently he's been a listener for a while. He says, I've been so happy that no agenda has been in my life these past 11 years. And here's to another 11 years. Great work, Craig from Omaha. Uh, Tony, Sch Tony Schmidt, $111.11. Thank you for your courage. Keith Gibson, one hundred one dollars. You know, this was a dr this was a drunk donation that made me laugh from Tony Schmidt. I don't know if you feel like it, but uh, I thank you. Okay, I'll give it a shot if, I, if he's really drunk. <laughs> I thank you for your courage, hard work, and collective sanity. With this donation, I like to call Sir Matthew McVader to the stage. If I do recall correctly, and I had a lot of beer, I love beer. He performs exclusively on the basement stage. <laughs> I'm not sure how I got down here or back up, but I know I was there, and I know it was him. Of course, the de-douching. <laughs> yeah. Two shots to the head and a karma. Shout out to freehollowbooks.com. And then <laughs> a the range stick shake to Florida because fuck them. <laughs> That was probably drunk. We don't do that. We don't do. We do uh, not operate the rain stick in that manner. This is not a device to be used in, for follies. I have it locked up. I don't want the kids getting hold of in it. In a gun case. Yeah. How'd you know? It's where it belongs. I don't have kids. Otherwise, I'd have it locked up in a gun case, too. Uh, Keith Gibson. Now, these are $101.01. This was to celebrate 1010 Day. Uh, in dimes, which is a famous Chinese uh, celebration, which is re which is actually celebrated by both the mainlanders and the uh, and the Republic of China, Taiwan. Keith, G I'm surprised I didn't get some nasty note about calling him Taiwan. Keith Gibson. Wait, 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 uh, wait, wait. We're calling it? It's called Taiwan. Well, you know, you know, it's a part of China. Well, who who like listens to this show is going to send you a nasty note about that? I don't know. The one Chinese who's in Hong Kong? Uh, no, they'd be more <laughs> inclined to agree with exactly. this idea. Exactly. They have to be on the mainland. They'd be in uh, Beijing. Keith, and they don't, you're right, they, nobody listens. Keith Gibson, they probably have a clone of the show over there. <laughs> Keith Gibson. Uh, yeah, it's called, uh, no, I, I can come up with some racist line for no agent. I can't come up with it. Keith Gibson, anonymous. Uh, he, he says he loves this. Oh, he's from loves from Zephyr Free Jack London Square, a former paradise. Oh. Yeah, that's because they have the big state train station there. No. Oh. Uh, Kalen Nistor, 101. Sir Malin, Malinowski in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Jeffrey Jock. I've been listening for a couple of years. 
uh, follow the tech industry. Very quickly, it became clear to me that your deconstruction of the search for context data and facts made the world a saner and simpler place. You're right. Uh, Sir Bob, the dude's name Ben, is this right? Am I right? Or am I no, 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 no. Uh, Charles, uh, <clears throat> what we got, who'd you just do? I just did. Uh, Jeffrey... Ja oh, yeah, then you get yeah, Sir, Jeffrey Jack. Sir, Sir, Jeffrey Jack. Sir Pete, Baron of Friesland in Northern Holland. Well, it won't come up on my spreadsheet because it's he put a note in there that is this, it's way too big. You have to read it or read the, the, who it is. I can't. We don't it. read these. I don't understand why you're reading all these notes. No, I, I'm not reading. I just I can't read his name or the amount he donated. One hundred one hundred one. Sir Pete, Baron of Friesland and Northern Holland, nine 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 nine. And he says, okay. "Thank you for your I'm excellent you, work on show ten seventy five. It just bounces around. Let me see if I can do it by uh, John. You've had this problem for years. It's because this. It's my, not my problem. It's the spreadsheets problem. Okay. Charles Schultz. Is that next? Mm-hmm. Or Aniston, uh, Alabama, 81. Sir Bob of the dude's name, Ben. Hi. You know, if people didn't put, I don't know how they get a note jammed in there like that. When people say, I can't write three words and then that PayPal won't take it. I have a feeling that this was forwarded from an email that Eric put in there. Well, maybe. So I think Bob, your problem is ben, your problem is North Eric. North. He's creating the spreadsheet. Sir Bob of the dude's name Ben in High Point, North Carolina. Jim Garbage. You know my latest policy is I say to Eric, just put that I have the note which I had on the other one earlier, and don't put it in the spreadsheet. Mm, I didn't know that was policy. But no, it's a new policy. Mm, I didn't get the memo. It's a new experimental beta policy. <laughs> That explains it then. <laughs> Sir Bob is of the dude's name Ben A O O A. Now I got grief for the last newsletter for not using a boobs Easter egg. Hmm. So I put one in this when I get one. <laughs> no one Jim, loves you. No, everyone. Jim Gab Gabach. <laughs> Gab Face it. No one really loves you. Jim Garbage. Garb Jim Garbazewski, <laughs> eighty. Uh, Stefan Aret. We have a, yeah, Aret. We have a uh, plumbing firm in the area named Aret. Now the in 6006, this is uh, in Fellbach. Which, which boob is the 6006? That's a lopsided. No, I don't know. it's not lopsided. It's saggy boob? Something's wrong. It's boobs woohoo. <laughs> something's wrong. Jim Buell in Spring Hill, Tennessee. Something's wrong. We have, oh, by the way. NC four RG seventy threes. Ah, seventy threes. Uh, Jim Buell fifty eight fifty eight in Spring Hill with a with a happy belated birthday to his smoking hot wife Stephanie. Chris Widden fifty oh five fifty fifty and then now we have fifty dollar donors name and location. Roy Tenhave in Pinacker. 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 Roy Tenhave. Roy Tenhofer. Nailed it. In Pine Knocker. Robert Bruckner. Kimberly Redmond in Toronto. Tony Smith in Fort Worth, Texas. Brett Yo in Cantonsville, Maryland. Larry Hay in Mooresville, North Carolina. Does anyone in Texas think that Fort Worth is a shithole? No, it's actually very beautiful, has a great airport, and that's where uh, things will be happening. Yeah, it's where Amazon's going to move. I thought that was a secret. Oh. You, you, you swore me to fucking secrecy. You said, we got to look for some real estate up there. It's another exit strategy. And now you're just I, telling everybody? The reason everybody? I say this is because I mentioned to a friend of mine, a Lib Joe, who seems to be worried sick that, that he's going to be swamped under by the rising oceans. <laughs> You should t ask him if he has a few hours to listen to my report on climate change. It'll change his mind. It's not that long. It's only an hour. Anyway, he uh, <laughs> he's moaning and groaning about this. And so and you I told him about Fort Amazon? Fort you told him our secret? It's going to be a, a great place to move. And he says it's a shithole. And I said, what are you Wait talking about? Wait a minute. This guy said, this Lib Joe said Fort Worth is a shithole? Yeah. Well, screw him. It's not all that bad. Where does I he... like the town. Well, anyway, so you might as well tell everyone now, now the cat is out of the bag, 
we've been researching Amazon moving to Fort Worth as their new headquarter. And you and I were like, oh, we got to buy some real estate. It's going to make us rich. Don't you remember the whole sworn to secrecy bit? I made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> now everyone's in on it. Well, they should be thinking about it. They should be it. thinking about it and working on our behalf, trying to find I an found exit. another real hot spot, by the way, oh. even cheaper. In what? Another Amazon possibility? No, no, no. This is a different, whole different game. Now, just, just so everybody knows, the reason why we, John came up with this is, you know, he's from Texas, Bezos. Uh, he's from that area. No, he's from Houston. Okay. I'm sorry. He's from Houston. Uh, they have a, uh, an airport there in uh, Fort Worth. They have a... Um, they have Alliance. A, what? It's Ross Perot's Alliance yes, Airport. Yes, Alliance, yes. Which would be perfect. There's a lot of buildings, a lot of space, zero taxes, state taxes at least. <clears throat> I still think it's a... When are they going to announce this? Well, Ross Perot's got some sort of a real estate operation that has been buying up crap all over the area. Ah, see. And I think they're just waiting so they until they're all settled in so they can say, you know, Disney had this thing he did. Disney when he formed Disneyland, which none of the banks wanted to help him with. So when he did Disney World down in Florida, he said, "Screw the banks, I'm going to do public offering, public bonds, and I'm never going to I'm not going to borrow from the banks anymore because they they didn't help me when I needed help." And so he never went back to the banks. But he he found one other problem with Disneyland is that around Disneyland, every sleazy little motel operator started, you know, planting their little little motels and anything to kind of impinge on Disneyland. And they're butted up right against the park. Mm -hmm. If you go to Disneyland, the whole little area around the park is all a bunch of little motels and yep. cheap restaurants. Yep. Yep. So he said, that's not going to happen again because it ruins the experience. Even though you're in the park, you don't really see outside. Really? It's a big... There's a hill around the whole park, so you can't look outside. But instead, he decided to buy up all of central Orlando. <laughs> and he did it with but with a phony baloney real estate company that was not associated with him, suppose, but it was. It was a front. And they bought up all the land they could to keep the same situation from reoccurring. Hmm. And so that's why that central Orlando is all Disney. It's like, well, oh. it actually doesn't matter because I have another strategy. The real estate, I mean, that's shot anyway. Uh, here's, here's my strategy. The minute we know which city that's in, and if it's going to be in Texas, I'm opening up a vape shop and a dog walking service. Well, I'm not going to say that those aren't great businesses for what you're describing. And that's exactly what was probably needed in, in Seattle because yep. he put in 75,000 jobs in Seattle and all these apartment buildings went up and all probably would be a good business if you wanted to run it you'd have to the problem is you have to run a business is different no. than just buying some real no, estate no we have producers we have producers what's guys you get dexter to help you <laughs> he's gonna make the juice we'll have amazon e-juice Ooh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. anyway that's our story all now right we're sticking we still have some story. more people to thank <laughs> We were stuck Sorry, in Fort Tony Worth. Smith is the guy in Fort Worth. <laughs> Thanks, Tony, for that and combo. By the way, Tony, buy up some property around your house and you can yeah. give us. Be on the lookout for a vape shop for me. Brett Yo in Cantonsville, uh, Maryland. Larry Hay in Mooresville, North Carolina. Richard Gardner, Sir Richard Gardner from. He's one of our Richard Gardners. We got a bunch of them. Jonathan Ferris in Liberal, Kansas. Drew Machik. Mochik. Machik. In El Cerrito, uh, Robert Decanay in Fairfax, Virginia, and last Kyle Meyer in Atlanta, Georgia. I want to thank all these folks for helping us out on show 1076, helping us produce and support this show uh, for, uh, with your great, genuine, generous donations. Yes, that is the way it works in our value for value system. What was the show worth to you? You send that amount of money and we thank you for it. Except if you're under $50, that's what people usually come in for an anonymous reasons or... Uh, you can always get on one of our subscriptions. We have a number of them. Check them out at our donation page. Dvorak.org slash N-A. And we have requests for F uh, Cancer Karma, some Jobs Karma, and I want to kick that off with a uh, new Jobs Karma Redux. I'll play the old one just, uh -oh. to, make sure, just to make sure it works. Uh, it was just kind of cute from uh, Tom Starkweather. The resistance. Job, job, jobs. Job, job, job. 
Jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs, 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 and jobs. Let's vote for jobs. Yay! Yeah! You've got karma. And here is uh, your birthday list on the No Agenda show for today. It is Thursday, October 11th, 2018. Uh, Belated birthday, congratulations. Jim Buell Buell says happy belated birthday to his smoking hot wife, Stephanie. She celebrated on the 5th of October. Antonio Sanchez Godinez uh, turned 60 on October 9th. Brandon Gamash will be 33 today. And Sir Bob with the dude's name, Ben, celebrated uh, yesterday as well. We say happy birthday to everybody here from the best podcast in the universe. And then we have our soul knighting for today, or anonymous. Uh, I need your blade there. Hello? Uh, it's stuck. Hold on a second. Okay. This, okay, I got it. That's right. Theater of the mind is not lost on him. Anonymous, come on up to the stage. We got a seat ready for you here at the round table of the No Agenda Knights and Dames. Thank you very much for your support of the best podcast in the universe, the amount of one thousand dollars or more. And I hereby pronounce the Kate the Sir Antonymous of Svealand. Yes, for you we have hookers and blow, red boys and chardonnay, fentanyl and four loco, cookies and vodka, wipers and waffles, chilled Polish potato vodka. We've got diet soda and video games, fish pie and fellatio, brown cheese and aqua beat with smalahova, harlots and how. Doll, breast milk and pablum, ginger ale and gerbil, sparkling cider and escorts, vodka and vanilla, bonnets and bourbon, and, of course, some mutton and mead. Head over to noagendanation.com slash rings uh, and uh, give Eric the show all the information you have, and we'll get that off to you as soon as possible. We actually had, I must, I think it was four or five different knights and dames uh, tweeting out pictures of their ring, the sealing wax certificate. Uh, we had one dame... Even uh, had a chalice and a nice bottle of wine in the picture. Did you see any of these? Because I, it, it... I retweeted all of them. It was a, it was like a run on it. Mm. It's like everybody was tweeting these things all around the same. I guess it was a, I guess it was just a recent mailing or something. Yeah. It was. I thought it was odd. So it was well, we've been because I've been asking for it and and people listened. Yeah. By the way, I get there's some scam that happened. Uh, but I have Geico as insurance. What for car insurance? Geico. Who sold you Geico? Was it a little lizard? Yes, yes, that was. I always liked the lizard campaign. So uh, when we moved to the common law condo, I put uh, uh, Tina on the insurance. Uh, Tina Snyder, S N I D R. So I get the most uh, recent bill comes in yes yesterday, a day before. Wait, wait, isn't Geico just property insurance no, and no, car insurance? I've I've had it for car insurance. So he, she's getting car insurance through Geico have, have, now? have you ever seen the commercials? <laughs> so I, actually, I, I love those commercials. They have a variety of different approaches, and they use them uh, kind yet, of in competition yet, with each yet other. Yet somehow the but commercial— I have no idea what they do. What they do <laughs> somehow the commercial did not convince you they do uh, car insurance. <laughs> Great commercials. So no, this is for, the, for, my, for my car. <laughs> so, Tina, she has her own insurance. She has Allstate, whatever. Well, Which is, doesn't the, her insurance cover you anything she drives? <sighs> okay, I'm just going to finish the story. All so right. I, yeah, I think you're supposed to put someone on if they're going to be a frequent driver. Um, doesn't matter. It didn't increase my premium. It made no difference. In fact, this is how. Oh, okay, it, I'll tell you how it happened. Uh, when I sold the Airstream, then I had to call them up to get rid of the extremely Airstream, ex- uh, extremely expensive Airstream insurance. And they said, "Well, you got anyone else in the who's who's driving the your car?" I said, "Yeah." And I said, "Okay, well, there'll be no change. Just put on the policy." Okay, it's fine. It's also like a gesture. We had mailed together. Yeah. Okay. It's common law. It's nice <laughs> to get a bill that isn't both our names. But yeah, until she sues you. But what happens the other day? I get a note and it says. Um, yeah, you know, uh, we, we, your premium has been recalculated and I think it went up by several hundred dollars. What? Yeah. 
your premium has been recalculated based upon the driving record of the drivers. And it, and at this, in the same letter, they say they have added uh, Elisa's daughter, sp- spelled incorrectly, her last name with a Y instead of an I, uh, to my insurance because she's uh, living in this house. Now, she's not. She's had a, I think she has a, a bank account that comes to this address. But they just took the liberty of just putting her on my insurance, recalculating my premium, which is more because, you know, she's 21 and she's had issues <laughs> driving. And I get this high insurance premium. What? This is an outrage. But if, you know, how can you do this? And it you does, can't. Oh, you can't? Well, they just did. Well, how? How did they even know? I mean, where did they get this information? I mean, Are they coming to somebody spooking around the house? Is well, there microphones there? What's going on? Well. So the bank that uh, Tina's daughter uses, I don't know which bank it is, or, or, or somewhere that she, no, actually, it's, it's an, the, her name is misspelled. So somewhere someone got a hold of her name, it's misspelled, some mail comes to this address. Spam, junk mail. And they sold that name to Geico, and Geico went, oh, it's same address, we better put her on the insurance. Especially since we can get more money. Man, I, is, it, is it an illegal I practice? I assume that you call your agent, no, it's who on, isn't a gecko. It's, I'm going to call gecko. They're on the list and for then today. And you're going to talk to the agent and say, this is bull crap, and they take it right off and you get your money back. Yeah, but I'm going to call them and I'm going to, I want a supervisor and I want to know what else are you doing? I'm going to make a stink about it. There should make a stink about it if they, if they correct it immediately. I'll make a stink about one of those those terrible clients. They're going to fuck you over if you try to make a stink. (laughs) I can always go to Tina's insurance. She has a great FICA score. Um, And the only other thing I wanted to mention is just while we're on grievances like this, Capital One, who Uh, I saw throughout the American Music Awards. Here's what I have to say to you. Capital One, for your use of music by Michael Jackson, Prince, and Whitney Houston, three superstars in my life, who I've respected and liked a lot and known for you to be the first to use their music. Well, Michael, not so much, but yeah, Michael Prince and Whitney Houston. Fuck you. It, it disgusted me. It really disgusted me. I don't, did anyone they else have this? For it? Sure. They did. It disgusted me that the family, cause they, they didn't want any of this. The families, they went, Oh, great. The record companies publishing. Oh yeah, that's great. Now let's whore them out now that they're dead and can't say anything. And that's bad enough, but then Capital One, you're gonna you're gonna use that? Nah. You guys suck. Maybe it'll curse them. I hope so. It it really irked me. I I it, you know, it's just like Prince didn't let he didn't even let you play his music. He's like, you can't have my music. <laughs> no one can have it. And then uh, he dies and uh, what is it? What is it? He's been dead what, a year, two years? I don't know. All his music is on Capital it's One. Recent. Yeah, no, it's, it's really annoying. Yeah, those guys are the market. Well, you, you, yeah. <laughs> well, you got one of the cards you already gave us a report. Let's talk about, I believe, which might be the six week cycle re- coming back. Uh, okay. This is the stupid 200 pound bomb story. Oh, yeah, let's revisit. You know this. anything about this? Mm, no. Where it was, was played it? by all the networks. Here, play it's two hundred. By the way, this two hundred pound bomb is an eight pound bomb in a in a wooden case, and so they weighed the whole thing. It was two hundred pounds. They call it two hundred pound bomb. Very misleading. Hey, that's not like two hundred pounds of TNT. It's not the no, same. It was. It was. It was eight <laughs> it <weighed> pounds. <laughs> it was eight pounds of black powder he bought online. Oh yeah, and it was and it was a hundred uh one hundred ninety two pounds of what. <laughs> Metal? Plywood. (laughs) A 56-year-old man from New York was charged today with making a huge bomb as part of a plot to blow himself up in Washington, D.C. on Election Day. Paula Reed fills us in on this. FBI agents today continued searching a home just north of New York City, where yesterday they discovered a 200-pound bomb. Prosecutors say Paul Rosenfeld planned to detonate that bomb in Washington, D.C. on Election Day. He allegedly wanted to kill himself and draw attention to his political beliefs. 
Over the past two months, according to court papers, Rosenfeld allegedly sent letters and text messages to a Pennsylvania resident detailing his plan to detonate the bomb on the National Mall to draw attention to the sortition political theory that advocates the random selection of government officials. The Pennsylvania resident alerted the FBI and police pulled Rosenfeld over Tuesday. After waiving his Miranda rights, Rosenfeld admitted his plan. He told agents he ordered... Wait a minute. He, he waived his Miranda rights? Who does that? A guy who's nuts? Oh, who's on the payroll. Yeah. Okay. The Pennsylvania resident alerted the FBI and police pulled Rosenfeld over Tuesday. After waiving his Miranda rights, Rosenfeld admitted his plan. <laughs> He told agents he ordered large quantities of black powder online, built small test explosives, and then used about eight pounds to construct the 200-pound explosive device in a plywood box in his basement. He said he installed certain components in the device to ensure that he was killed in the blast. <laughs> FBI technicians removed the bomb from his basement and transferred it to a safe location. Uh, At a Senate hearing this morning, uh, FBI Director Christopher Wray said his agents are investigating about a thousand homegrown terror threats uh -oh. in all 50 states. Terrorism. Now, those ah, cover the waterfront okay. uh, of the full range of extremist ideologies from right to left and everything uh -huh. in between. Oh, wow. No, this is this is a this is a different kind of reboot. We're moving away from the crazy Islamic terrorists to crazy Republican white nut, nut job men. Yeah, that's what's going on here. Be oh. white guys. And there's thousands of these white guys with these plywood well, bombs. This, I thought they upped the ante because if you remember, it was the previous FBI guy, Comey, who said that I maybe been gone back to Mueller. But one of them said, we 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 believe we have at least one per state, every state. There's 50 of these, you know, nutcases out there. They're going to do something that we have to keep an eye on them. Now it's changed to 1,000. <laughs> so that's how many per state? 200? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Yeah. No, no, it's not 200. That's, you're, you're off. Uh, it would be oh, five. No. Or, I mean, no. would be, uh, no, get, I'm even I'm <laughs> 20. Now. How about let's try 20. 20. There you go, 20. 20. Let's try 20. Yeah. No, but you know what? Before the, before the year is over, it'll be 200. The, the rate oh, they're going. Thousands, the, state. thousands, thousands of these guys. Well, who knows what's up with the FBI? Well, I'm marking today's date as a six-week cycle date. Okay. And we're going to keep it track Synchronized on watches and mark. Okay. That's how they do it in the, in the TV shows. And mark. Now, the other disgusting story is this. Do you know about this? They're putting, didn't we talk about this on the last show? About Facebook coming out with an Alexa device? No, you talked about it on DH Unplugged. Ah. Well, I'm glad you listened. Huh. This, you got a clip here about this thing. I Why would anybody put this in their house? <laughs> the question is, why is Facebook marketing it at this moment? Why should people trust Facebook to put this kind of device into their homes? So we have this sign privacy from the ground up. The fact that we no, were able to build reason. from the hardware, the software, the AI technology that we show you, uh, we have put privacy on every layer of the stack. Facebook is uh -huh. obviously an advertising business. So are you going to use this screen to put advertising in people's homes? No, that, that's not really the plan. I, we don't think we can get even uh, much value, neither to our users nor, nor to us that way. Because it brings Facebook right into your home, looking at you every day. Um, we don't know too much about what information Facebook is going to retain from these devices. The only thing that companies could be sure about is that somehow the device is going to be hacked. That's what we've seen over and over and over again. <laughs> okay, girl genius. Well, Facebook is doing a lot of things. I'm seeing them advertising their Facebook Marketplace a lot, uh, which is their uh, their Craigslist type deal. Uh, I don't know any of this. Oh, it's on. T I see it all the time. These ads on TV for Facebook. They're high. I have not seen any hmm. of these ads. Okay. Uh, I'm a little. I'm a little cord cutted, but yeah. I do well, I know they're in trouble. You know, people are walking away. You know, I think they they've got to focus a lot of energy on uh, the Insta, um, which is I think is if the revenue is not already coming from there, it's it will in the future. It just seems to be the winner. It's a real winner. 
And I think this was just on the books. You know, it's a big company. It's like something, yeah, well, screw it. Just, yeah, it's got to come out then. Yeah, we'll release it. I haven't seen him. I mean, I, I saw the news uh, shows jumping on it with this, with a similar story, but they're not really, I don't see anyone out there pushing it. No statement from Zuck about how great it is. I think it was just in the planning and just got to release it and get it done with. Unless they start really pushing it for Christmas, which I think is um, unlikely. Now, I had another story, uh, and I, I was only going to mention it until I, if, unless I got the right clip. And I think I got the right clip. It was from a local Fox station. This is the emotional squirrel story, which I'm sure you, oh, you heard. Uh, yeah, but, some idiot brings a wild squirrel onto an airplane and expects to be led on as an emotional support squirrel. All of your questions about this process are answered, and she actually answers them in this clip. We heard that there was a squirrel on the plane that we needed to get off. Passenger Cindy Tork brought her emotional support squirrel on the plane, but Frontier Airlines said they don't allow rodents. I said, you're not taking my squirrel, sorry. Cindy was coming to visit family in Cleveland. She tells Fox 8 she got her squirrel named Daisy to help with severe anxiety. She'll fit in the palm of my hand. I can cover her up with my other hand. She gives you kisses. She says she went to the check-in desk with Daisy, but when she got in her seat, there was a problem. And she said, are you getting off the plane? If you don't, then we have to deboard everybody. Okay, deboard them. But I'm taking my squirrel with me. <laughs> Everyone on the plane had to get off. We didn't want to get off. We were like, we're ready to go, let's go, but just a squirrel. Who would have a squirrel? No offense, as a pet. And police came to take Cindy and the squirrel off too. It's cruel what they did to me. She should not have been able to get past TSA. If the squirrel was an animal that can't be on the plane, why did she even get as far as she did? That's a good question. Cindy went through security with no problem. He said, you can hold her so she doesn't have to go through x-ray. And TSA told us in an email the squirrel was screened the same way someone's cat would be screened. The container was sent through the x-ray machine and the passenger carried the squirrel through the walk through metal detector. They say it's up to the airlines to determine if an animal may fly. Cindy says she understands why Daisy might not be welcome on a plane. If somebody brought a rat or a snake or a spider, tarantula, onto the plane, I would feel a little creepy. I can sympathize with the people that don't want Wait for the kicker. She was in a carrying case. Frontier says it wasn't clear. Cindy's animal was a squirrel, but they still refunded her money and gave her a ticket voucher. But Cindy says that's not enough. I will own a big portion of this airline. (laughs) I'm going for blood. I am going all the way. I am contacting an attorney and take it from there. <laughs> I'm going for blood. <laughs> Squirrel. I'm, I'm going to own a big portion of this airline. We have now officially gone insane. Well, she has. It's just the start. and I, But I love how... If the, if the thing was in a cage, you know, I wonder what carrier, the big deal like a was. carrier. Now the, the thing is, everyone they had in the reports like that's just crazy. You do a squirrel, just crazy. Now a goat and all these these are okay. I, I Goats don't think aren't okay either. Yeah, but on some airlines they are. Yeah, if you're flying to Mecca. <laughs> all right. I thought uh, it was just some things. collective insanity couple of things I got here. Um, I have a, this, did you see the the clip that was going around Twitter on John Meyer, the performer with his guitar? On yes. Stage? I was actually going to mention to you that I, earlier before we started the show, uh, I secreted some toxic masculinity on the, on the mixing table. Well, wipe it up. <laughs> it needs a big sponge. John Mayer, all right, this needs some lead-in, I think. John Mayer, okay, you give the lead-in, because I don't have a good John lead-in. Mayer is a womanizer. He's yeah. a total womanizer, and all of a sudden, he's like Mr. Bitch. Bullshit is the idea that if you're a man, any woman you see, you should be able to get an erection. By the way, stop it right there. 
what – who subscribes to this policy? He, he, he says that part of the male problem is that if you're a man, you should be able to get an erection for any woman, period. It, I, I've never had that experience. I'm not walking around with an erection all the time. But this is, I, There's plenty of women that don't have any appeal to me. I don't know John Mayer personally, but he comes across to me as the type of character who – um, really disrespects women because he thinks they're all his conquest, and he has proven that. He's also well, he's the type just projecting. Then he's all he's doing is projecting yes. and blaming all men for his problems. Yes, this is the kind of guy that stops with his sports car next to the girl, and he's uh, and he turns up the radio really loud with some thumping song. That's John Mayer. That's this kind of guy. He's a douche, and now yes, now he's projecting. And I I agree. What is this bull crap? The, the men think that they should always get an erection for every woman they see. Uh, no. No, it's, it's very, very douchey. Bullshit is the idea that if you're a man, any woman you see, you should be able to get an erection. And when we don't, that's the trauma. That I don't want it to be the male contract. I'm telling you that's the contract, and we have to tear the contract up. And we What's that? I quite honestly, and I'm having a hard time hearing it now. I saw this clip played on news stations, and I'm like, why are you even playing this clip? You can't hear what he says. He's just like, uh, tear the contract up. Uh, no, you don't, you don't have to play it. No, it's I, no, I want to play just, it. I fu- I found this to be extremely annoying. Uh, Who's this guy think he is? I want to play more. Speaking for all men. I want to play more because this is the longest version of the clip I've seen. It, oh, my God. What is happening? Man, no, hold on. This is fine. She's actually asking a really decent, uh, pertinent question. What you're saying, what is the male contract then? The male contract is to, at between the ages of whatever, puberty and college, to be instructed to have a class, to have a voice of reason taught to young men. You are not supposed to be able to do this to everything that moves. You are not entitled to be able to do this to everything that moves. This does not come naturally to a man. This does not come unnaturally to a man. You do not possess the universal ability to have any woman that you see. The great philosopher John Mayer, everybody. I think he was coming out as gay. (laughs) That's totally possible. (laughs) I'm going to do a quick uh, triage of Trump hates. We start with CNBC, who just can't stop comparing him to Nixon. Recent data that have a chief to have a president call out the Fed in that aggressive way, if at all. So advised. Um, Nixon was critical in his day. Well, he was an idiot. I mean, look, he was really good on the China thing. We're undoing that now, right? Uh, But, you know, Nixon was, uh, he's not the role, you know, classically not the role model, including the uh, Christmas Day bombing of the Children's Hospital in North Vietnam. Okay. Morning, Joe. Uh, Wait, 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 wait. What was that? That was sound like Kramer. What's he got to do with this conversation? That's, what, that's all they talk about is CNBC. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah. Morning. Now, are you familiar with the two minutes of hate, this term, this concept? No. You will be reminded by the Morning Joe show uh, uh, during this little segment. <laughs> about Feinstein. Can you believe that? Before the hate had proceeded for 30 seconds, uncontrollable exclamations of rage were breaking out from half the people in the room. In its second minute, the hate rose to a frenzy. People were leaping up and down in their places and shouting at the top of their voices. The horrible thing about the two minutes hate, that's the name of the exercise, was not that one was obliged to act apart, but that it was impossible to avoid joining in. And yet, the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion, which could be switched from one object to another like the flame of a blow lamp. Sound like a Trump rally? State. 
That was former Massachusetts Governor Bill Weld in November of 2016, reading from George Orwell's 1984 and predicting what we are now seeing two years later as last night's what? Trump campaign rally broke out into a spontaneous chant demanding to lock up Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein. There you are. We've arrived in 1984. Have anybody gone to one of these things? You've been to one. You see them. If you watch them, these people are just doing it just to irk. They're doing it not as hate. They're doing it as kind of a, a like a moment of irking the other side. <laughs> it's humorous. Uh huh. It's a, actually a moment, two minutes of humor more than it is two minutes of hate. Well, but that piece was completely produced with this in mind. They overlaid two events. You know, to, oh, that is so pathetic. Ah, it's what I'm going to give you a clip of the day for that, only because it's clip of the day. <laughs> okay. It's, it's a really, day. really sick clip. Sick. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for the sickness sick. of the clip. Sick, 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 and more sick. <laughs> Not as sick as my uh, my last clip in the triage. You may have seen this one, but I'd like to play this on the show so that we have it on the show. Because not everyone sees the the insanity. This was uh, on the Don Lemon show. As you know, he is the overnight sensation on CNN. Along with him, Tara Setmeyer. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bakari Sellers. And uh, then there's uh, one guy from, I don't know, the uh, Daily Beast or something like I'm that. I'm going to, after you play this clip, I'm going to t- explain why I didn't clip it. Okay. And then I'll explain, I'll tell you what I think about it. So here it is. This is about uh, Kanye West meeting with Donald Trump. Kanye West is what happens when Negroes don't read. Um, and, and we have this now. And now Donald Trump is going to use it and pervert it. And he's going to have somebody who can stand with him and take pictures. <laughs> Just looking at Scott's <laughs> Listen, black folks are about to you know, trade Kanye West in the racial draft, okay? They've had it with him, and he's an attention whore like the president. <laughs> he's all of a sudden now the, the, the model spokesperson. He's, he's the token Negro of the, of the Trump administration. This is ridiculous, and no one should be taking Kanye West seriously. He clearly has issues. He's already been hospitalized. Okay, why didn't you clip it? I think there's a lot to, to unpack here. Well, first of all, that's a clip of a clip. Because in the interim, they talked about how the the Negro who doesn't read a book and and taking a Negro on the Negro draft or whatever mm-hmm. she was saying mm-hmm. were both taken, and they were expressed. They expressly mentioned that they were taken from comedy skits. Oh really? Uh, one was Chris Rock's. He's the one who did the Negro doesn't read a book, and then the yeah. other one was some other comic that the the third person that was on that panel brought that up. He says, "Well, at least I got that reference." Uh-huh. So these were references to comedy acts, and that's what had Don Lemon cracking up. I just thought it was just they were trying to be funny, and they weren't very funny. And I don't, I see, I, lo- I saw all the tweets. Oh my God, they said this and they said that. But geez, if you're gonna give, if you want to give Trump a break for being humorous, you got to give the other side a break too if they're trying to be funny i actually it wasn't serious uh i have i i was i was i too was like why is everyone upset i love this i wish people would talk more like this on cnn at least it's a little more real this is the kind of jokes you make this is jokes you make amongst yourselves i don't know uh i mean i've been amongst african americans and when there's some jokes it's funny we, if you're gonna bitch about nobody, oh nobody gets it that Trump's funny. He's actually funny, and this and the and the locker up is really actually funny. It's humorous. It is. You got to give the other side the same leeway. I didn't realize was this because then I got uh, duped by this. Was this somewhere in their conversation? They mentioned it was that they right. Were, it, it was right. Uh, I'll tell you. Uh, no, no. It let me right. let me tell you what happened. Let me tell you what happened. I did not do what I did with the Tucker Carlson clip. I did not go and look for the original. I did not notice an edit. So what you're saying is it's edited. Yes. Ha. Huh, okay. Well, then, you know what? That's actually all the reason to bring it to the show and explain that. Because it's going around ex- exactly what you said. Like everyone's all going crazy, but they were jokes and they actually explained that. Oh. Yeah, they referenced the jokes. I think the jokes are funny. I but, thought so too. But more importantly, that's how normal people talk amongst themselves. It was good. <laughs> you know, if you want to jump all over these that. boneheads, I think earlier in the show you did it. You found some clip of some idiot claiming that that uh, 
uh, what one of the judges was, or uh, Clarence Thomas was a sexual predator, right. or he's a se- he a sexual assaulter. He didn't right. do anything. But right. that's where you there's your condemnation, not against a mild commentary. <laughs> right. I wasn't condemning. I, again, I I like it. No, I know you didn't. I thought I didn't know where where you're going to go with it. But I just thought it was humorous. I, but I thought it was humorous, especially in in lieu of the of the notice they gave discussing the origins of this of these lines. Okay, there is one part of it though that is not okay, and uh, that's not okay by today's okay. social justice standards. And someone sh- and uh, what's her face, uh, Tara Setmeyer, should be called out on it. It's this last bit. It's the token Negro of the of the Trump administration. This is ridiculous, and no one should be taking Kanye West seriously. He's clearly has issues. He's already been hospitalized. You don't make fun of these people. This is in the victim culture, social justice warrior. That is verboten. You yeah, don't, you don't say this. You don't say, hey, who can't take him serious? He's already been treated for mental problems. Uh, blah. Yeah, that's that's very egregious. Too. That's egregious. That's really that, not okay. That was un, un, inexcusable. Now, my last little thing, or last one of two is what is the deal that started with the guy, apparently some astronaut, this is all over Twitter, and I put a, a, a one of the, uh, I put the little back and forth tweets on the newsletter. <laughs> uh, astronaut comes back and he quotes oh, uh, Winston. Oh, Scott, Scott Kelly. Yeah, he quotes Winston Churchill. And then he gets a bunch of these SJWs jump all over him saying, uh the racist of all time. He's the worst man ever. Winston Churchill was a douche. They go on and on. And so then there's, and then it ends up showing up on Good Morning Britain. Uh, <laughs> of course. With the, what's, with the, you know, his oh, name. And Pierce Morgan. Pierce Morgan and, and his cast. They brought out some guy. Of course, you know, you, you know how to do this. You've done it. You bring out some guy who's a bonehead, you know, the worst possible character. They brought in a professor, black guy. Uh, from Haiti or somewhere, some black guy teaches at some n- no-name college in London, and they bring him out just to stir things up. And it, and it's fine. I mean, this guy has his opinion. He's a, kind of a douche. And they, re- but what is the point in the first place of jumping all over these guys because they're old white guys who yes. had some influence on the culture? Yes, amongst many other things that men are responsible for. Well, listen the way this goes down. Why? I mean, the historical record here is clear. Even Boris Johnson admits that he was a racist. He was someone who believed that the white race was superior, that natives didn't have any right to their lands in the Americas, that Indians were a ghastly people, and just was a general imperialist racist. Is it was there any way that we can say, because those were the views of their time, and the fact that he actually achieved something which saved, defended, protected our nation means that we can separate those things well, out. That's the other. Jimmy Savile defense, isn't it? It was just a bit different back in the day. Well, so <laughs> <Lincoln's laughs> <Winston laughs> <Churchill. laughs> Jimmy Savile. Well, let's wow. make a better comparison. At the time, Leo Amory, the Secretary of India, not an anti racist, actually said that Churchill's views were so extreme on India, he couldn't separate them from Hitler's. And the truth is, Hitler was a great military leader, a product of his time, and if they won the war, we'd be having discussion now. But- <laughs> uh, does it, do people watch that show? I think so. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Jimmy Savile. Yeah. The so, the child so, rapist. So Churchill and Jimmy Savile, kind of the same kind of thing. There. Totally what are they the trying same. Trying to accomplish with this. This is just annoying people. By the way. Well, this is a version of us pulling down statues. You know, let's go after Churchill now. Yeah. And you know what? Everybody needs their 15 minutes. They got a, you know, got a story. You're some whack job. The television news, especially, it's not that this was news. It's just useless. <coughs> Except for C-SPAN. That's kind of useful still. Well, I got two shorties. Now, you already said you had two shorties, and you can do no, one more. one left. Then. Yeah, one more. I'll skip the love baguette. And this is good. This is a new disease we now have to fret about. A new disease. Tonight, doctors in Chicago say two-year-old Julia Payne has acute flaccid myelitis, or AFM, the rare polio-like disease on the rise. Her mother thought she had a cold. 
I took her to the ER because she turned blue. I noticed she couldn't hold her head up anymore and she couldn't use her right arm. Doctors believe AFM, which can cause partial paralysis, is linked to viruses, but say there's no known cure. Hand washing the best protection. The CDC confirming at least 38 infections in 16 states. Now investigating even more, including a new cluster in Illinois. We started to see clusters of it back in 2014, and it went away relatively in 2015, and then we saw a resurgence of cases again in 2016. Tonight, doctors scrambling to solve a medical mystery. Why are some children falling ill from such a dangerous disease? I've never heard of this. Well, you're going to start hearing about it. I think that was the salvo. I don't quite get the premise when she said the woman took the baby in or the kid in because she thought she had a cold. Mm. And the description was her. she turned blue, couldn't lift her arm, and couldn't lift her head. She couldn't breathe maybe then. Well, I mean, it's something's up, but it's not a cold. But it has this name, AFM. So th- yeah, it's AFM. been around clearly. Yeah. Mm. Okay. You bum me out with that, so let's let's play the love baguette because I can't leave on dead children. Good. Love baguette. The love baguette is not just a funny shaped loaf of bread. Its ribbon shape emulates the symbol of the French nonprofit Eds, which raises money to fight and prevent AIDS. Like 900 other bakers in France, Marc Antoine Hébert is selling this baguette for two euros. Half the proceeds are sent to the organization. This is the first time Marc Antoine has participated. Even his clients, who aren't familiar with the Love Baguette, appreciate the initiative. If you can help fight the disease, I'd buy a Love Baguette regularly. <laughs> Last year, the Love Baguette helped raise 80,000 euros, money that Ed's used to buy HIV screening kits and finance preventative measures. I think I would have preferred the dead children, honestly. <laughs> I predict Love Baguettes in the United States within the next six months. A lot of predictions. By the way, the love baguette is like that little ribbon, you know, the little yeah, ribbon. like a like a pretzel. Only it's not. It's like a pretty it's, pretzel. Well, it's a big giant thing. It's a yeah. baguette. Yeah. You know, it's pretty. Huge. All right, everybody. Uh, that's our show. I will remind you that Google Plus closed because you cannot monetize the network. And I am coming to you from downtown Austin, Texas, capital of the Drone Star State. I'm, uh, what is it, uh, Fever Region 6 on the governmental maps. That's what it is. It's already forgetting. In the 5x9 Cludio in the common law condo. In the morning, everybody, I'm Adam Curry. And from Northern California, where uh, the mud flats are still there. I'm John C. Dvorak. You said it again. It's Northern Silicon Valley. I said it on purpose this time. <laughs> Remember us at Dvorak.org slash NA. We return on Sunday, and you can always support us at Dvorak.org slash NA. Until then, adios, mofos. The resistance. Job, job, jobs. Job, job, job. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. The resistance. Job, job, jobs. Job, job, job. Jobs, jobs, jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs. The resistance. Jobs, 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 jobs. And Major X is saying the New York Times has revealed President Trump inherited his family's wealth. But the GC species, we can't relent. President Trump inherited his family's wealth. And here's an example of this. New Zealand hasn't been affected by these attacks. You know that's not true, Tom. We can't relent. Stodge is an outright fraud. Well, you think it was... No, there was one there.
Good. How did you get home, my dollars? An inflation adjusted dollars from his father's there real estate inflation. inflation. The New York Times, 13,000, 50, 50 million dollars. Right? I said, so cool. About dollars in tax and a major exposition. The tax got the GC's basis. Inherited his family's wealth. Years ago, was it? I don't know. The New York Times, thirteen thousand fifty million dollars. Thirty-six years. Beer. The New York Times has revealed President Trump inherited his family's wealth. Think it was no, it was one beer. Good. Inherited his family's wealth. There it is. Inflation. It was one beer. Good. Thirteen thousand fifty million dollars. Beer. Good. How did you get home? I don't know. It was super gay. He's getting lunch at Chipotle. The tortoise in the race. Kim Kardashian, Siganoi Weaver. Rush. R E S P I C T. They're all jitty. R-E-S-P-I-C-T. There's no real conflict. Resist. We must. Resist. We must. We must. And we will much about that be committed. Dvorak.org slash N-A Squirrel!